built a new stadium. They named it Michael A. Monsoor Memorial Stadium. The golden trident that the Seals wear the yard line. One year ago this week, San Diego, California, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsoor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet, Zumwalt class. This is Monsoor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship named in honor of her son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsoor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. There's no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to save your friends, said Jesus of Nazareth before he went to the cross. Michael Monsoor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anybody sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But in today's culture today, we don't believe the story is true. After all, it has miracles in it. We don't believe in miracles anymore. And it was written down by religious people. We know religious people tend to embellish things. They make things up. So how can we believe such a story is true? Actually, I think it's easy to show that it's true. You only need to answer four questions in the affirmative. In other words, if you investigate these four questions, I think you'll realize that the answer to these four questions is yes. And if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. <laughs> Now that is some pretty grooving and loud music. That is actually from our TV show on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. It's on DirecTV channel 378. If you don't have DirecTV, it's on Roku. Do you guys know what Roku is? Look for NRB TV on Roku for National Religious Broadcasters. If you don't have DirecTV and you don't have Roku, it's on this new technology sweeping Columbus. It's called the Internet. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, it's a broadcast on our website at that time. We're also on radio every Saturday morning at a number of stations around the country. That is podcasted. It's on our app, the Cross-Examined app. Two words in the app store, Cross-Examined. And we, uh, what we do is we present evidence for Christianity and we cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. And these, this is going to serve as our outline here tonight. We're going to go through these four questions. The first question is, does truth exist? And a lot of people say, well, no, you know, there's no truth. You got your truth. I got my truth. All truth is relative. Obviously, if all truth is relative or, or there's no truth, Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there's no truth, then atheism can't be true or any worldview can't be true, right? So we're going to deal with that question first. Second question, does God exist? Obviously, Christianity can't be true if there's no God. But I hope to show you tonight there really is a theistic God. What's a theistic God? That's a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things. We're going to look at three arguments for this being. These arguments are mentioned in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to know them. In fact, we're not even going to refer to the Bible when we do point two. You don't need the Bible to know that God exists. That would be circular anyway. The third question is, are miracles possible? And a lot of people don't believe in miracles today, but I hope to show you that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and even atheists are admitting the data for this miracle. Then we're going to get to the key question, is the New Testament true? The New Testament doesn't have a prayer if there's no truth, no God, or no miracles. But if truth exists, if God exists, if miracles are possible... Then we can see if the New Testament is reliable enough, not in Aaron or any of that, just reliable enough to let us know if one particular event from the ancient world took place, and that would be the resurrection of Jesus. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, game over, Christianity is true. Of course, if he didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false. You might as well sleep in on Sunday and do what you want the rest of the week. 
because it's false. Even the greatest apostle Paul said, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, your faith's in vain. Now, I know some of you are looking at this list going, wait a minute, Frank, what about the Old Testament? You believe the Old Testament's true? Well, look, if the New Testament's reliable, you get the Old Testament thrown in. Why? Who's in the New Testament that can authenticate the Old Testament? Jesus, yes. If you're ever in Sunday school, you don't know the answer, just say, Jesus, you'll probably be right. (laughs) It's Jesus, Pastor, that's right. Look, if Jesus really is God, as the New Testament documents claim he is, now that's a big if, but if he really is God, whatever God teaches is true. Jesus taught the entire Old Testament as the word of God, so if the New Testament's reliable, you get the Old Testament thrown in. Now, there's actually a lot more questions or more points you can go through. If you want to go further, you can get the book. We ran out of them at Purdue last night, so we don't have them here, but you can get them on our website. There's also a 12-part DVD series called Why I Still Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It's over seven hours long. You can get uh, workbooks with it, curriculum. And then there's a newer book there called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. I've noticed that when atheists are arguing there is no God, they're actually stealing aspects of reality that would only exist if God existed in order to say he doesn't exist. In effect, they have to sit in God's lap to slap his face. Now, this presentation that I'm about to show you, I can't show you the whole thing. We don't have time. If you want the entire presentation, text the word evidence to 44222. Text the word evidence to 44222. Don't put quotes around it, just the word evidence. And we'll send you this PowerPoint presentation in a PDF format. We'll also send you the first chapter of Stealing from God and a bunch of other stuff, all right? Uh, So what we're going to do here is we're going to go through these four questions and then we're going to do Q&A. Actually, I don't, I don't think we're going to do Q&A. I think we're going to do all Q, no A. All right? <laughs> so everyone will be able to ask a question. It will take all the pressure off me. All right? No, no, no. We'll, we'll do Q&A at the end. But we're going to start right here at does truth exist? Are you guys ready to go? All right. Whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. Right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand, and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, (laughs) Buckeyes, Purdue did it better last night. I mean, please. If he had said it that way, the movie would have gone nowhere. You can't handle the truth. That's not how he said it. Here's how he said it. Truth. All right, let's try, try that again. again. I, I want, want the, the truth. truth. You can handle the truth. Now, that, that felt better, better, didn't it? That I did. did. Well, well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth. I got my truth. There is no truth. All truth is relative. Well, if you don't get anything outside of what, you, what we talk about here tonight, this is probably the most important thinking skill we're going to talk about. In fact, um, whether you're an atheist or a Christian or anywhere in between, this will be helpful. And this thinking skill is so important that half of what you need to know in order to find truth, you'll know by this thinking skill. It takes only five minutes to learn. And what this thinking skill will do for you is it will help you avoid what is false. Because there's a lot of things in our culture that are taught or are on the internet or just out in culture in general that are false. And they're demonstrably false. And you can show they're false with one simple tactic, and I want to show you that tactic here. And to, by the way, to show you how, how uneducated I was, I had a master's degree, and I didn't even know this. And it's so simple, but I was such a dimwit, I was never taught this. And it's just a simple rule of logic. And here's the thinking skill. If someone were to come up to you and say something like, there is no truth, you should ask that person a question, what should the question be? <laughs> yeah, if somebody says there's no truth, you're going to say, hey, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true. But it claims to be true. Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. But that's because it's a self-defeating statement. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English. If I were to say I can't speak a word in English, what would you say? You just did. Or it'd be like if I said my parents had no kids that lived. Or my brother is an only child. Right? These are self-defeating statements. And once you get good at recognizing self-defeating statements, you're going to avoid a lot of pain and suffering for yourself. Why? Because if you start living by false principles, you're going to smack up against reality and it's going to hurt. 
you got to avoid what's false, and that's what this little tactic does. And here's the tactic. What you do is you, you turn the claim on itself. Turn the claim on itself. So if somebody says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself, and you say, is that true? Let's do a few more of these. How about if somebody says all truth is relative? Yeah, just say, is that a relative truth, right? Because that's an absolute truth, claiming all truth is relative. You see that? Or suppose somebody says there are no absolutes. Yeah, is that an absolute? Are you absolutely sure? How about if somebody says you can't know anything? How do you know that you can't know? Okay, you guys are sharper than Purdue. I'm just telling you right now. Now, now you're, you're with me on this. How about if somebody says um, you should doubt everything? Should we doubt that? Yeah. You ever notice that skeptics are skeptical of everything but skepticism? Why don't they doubt that? By the way, uh, whether you're a Christian, atheist, anywhere in between in here, uh, how many people in here sometimes doubt that what you believe is true? Look, I do. I mean, if you, you don't doubt, you're probably not thinking very much, right? I mean, I've written books on this stuff, and sometimes I wake up in the morning and I go, I don't even know if this is true. You ever do that? But then I start thinking about my doubts, and I realize that my doubts are more emotional than they are intellectual. In other words, the evidence for Christianity is really good, but I'm having a bad day, so I go, uh, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's good. Another day, fine, everything's good. Bad day, don't know. Good day, fine, bad day, don't know. Good day, fine, bad day. What's, what's changing, me or the evidence? Me, I'm going up and down. In fact, sometimes people will say at an event like this, or they'll email me and say, Frank, you know, I used to be a Christian, but I lost my faith. Now, I don't mean to be unkind, but since I'm from New Jersey, sometimes I am. And I almost want to say, when they say I lost my faith, I almost want to say, so? So? Because your psychology changed? Are you telling me God no longer exists? Because your psychology changed? Jesus didn't rise from the dead? You know, your psychology can change every day. Your psychology will not tell you whether or not anything is true, much less Christianity. What will tell you whether, whether something's true? The evidence will. Concentrate on the evidence, not your psychology going up and down. And I think if you really concentrate on the evidence, you'll realize that Christianity, it really does appear to be true. And what you ought to do is you ought to start doubting your doubts because if you start doubting your doubts, then you're back to knowing something for sure. Have you guys thought about doubting your doubts? I doubt it. <laughs> well, how about this? You hear this a lot. There's no truth in anything but science. Turn the claim on itself. Somebody says there's no truth in anything but science, what would you say? Is that a scientific truth? No, that's a philosophical claim. You can't prove that in the laboratory. In fact, all disciplines are built on philosophy. When you get a PhD, what does the PhD stand for here at The Ohio State University? It stands for philosophy, right? Philosophy of history, philosophy of physics, philosophy of biology, whatever it is. You can't do science without philosophy. Uh, by the way, you can't read the Bible without philosophy either, or any other book. Science is built on philosophy. In fact, in the, uh, the book uh, Stealing from God, we have a chapter on science in there, and the title of the chapter is, Science Doesn't Say Anything. Scientists do. Why? Because all data needs to be gathered, and all data needs to be interpreted, and who does that? Scientists do that. Now, sometimes they're interpreting the data based on their pre-existing atheism. Even though the evidence may point towards some sort of intelligence, they've already ruled intelligence out before they looked at the evidence. So is it any wonder they always conclude it's got to be a natural cause? That's a result of philosophy, not science. Now, think about this. Some of, most of the most important things in life have nothing to do with science. Honey, do you love me? I don't know. Let's run an experiment. No. Oh, how about this? You hear this a lot, too. You ought not judge. Somebody says you ought not judge. What are you going to say? Yeah, then why are you judging me for judging? Because it's a judgment. You notice that? You say, wait a minute, Frank. Time out. You claim to be a Christian. Didn't Jesus say don't judge? Nope. Never said it. He Sure he did. He said it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Okay, I know this is going to sound a little weird, but I think it's true. There are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. You think when Matthew was writing the Gospel of Matthew, he went, okay, here's chapter 7, verse 1. No. 
When were those chapter and verse divisions put in? About 500 years ago to help us navigate the text, which is important because it's a really big series of books. You can get lost in there. The problem is we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can take it out and make it say whatever we want. Jesus never said, judge not and stop right there. What did he say after that? He said, judge not, lest you be judged by the same standard you judge others, you'll be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, you hypocrite, which is a judgment, take the log out of your own eye first, and then you'll be better able to help your brother. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? No, he's telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He's simply saying, get that problem out of your life first so you can better help your brother. So this is not a command not to judge. It's actually a command on how to judge. In other words, don't judge hypocritically. If you've got that problem, fix it, then go help your brother. But it would be completely ridiculous to say don't make judgments. Why? Because, number one, it's a judgment itself. Number two, you'd be dead already if you didn't make judgments. You made 100 judgments just getting over here tonight. Good choices from bad choices, safe choices from dangerous choices. And now you're wondering if you made the right judgment. <laughs> Everybody makes judgments, by the way. Atheists make judgments. What, what atheists judge? Well, they judge there's no God. They judge Jesus didn't rise from the dead. They judge there's no objective moral values. They judge there's no objective meaning to life. These are all judgments. The question isn't whether or not you can make judgments. The question is, are your judgments true? I will say this, though, that Jesus did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental, like many Christians have been. And who were the judgmental ones in his day? The Pharisees, right? Who were the Pharisees? Well, they were the religious and political leaders of Israel. They helped run Israel politically. Some of them were on the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. They were the politicians. And Jesus went after these people. Are you telling me Jesus got involved in politics? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What happens in John chapter 2? Jesus makes a whip, and he goes, and he jacks people up in the temple. What? Jesus did this? Yes. And then in John chapter 8, he's talking to these same Pharisees, these religious political leaders. He gets the point in the conversation. He's having a bit of an argument with them. He says, your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Excuse me, I am Christ. Can you imagine that? You're having an argument with somebody, and you go, your father is the devil. Never do that with a sibling, by the way. Um, and then in, jo in Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you brood of vipers, you snakes. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside. You're whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, and then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? Sweet? And gentle Jesus said this? Yes, Jesus was not Barney. <laughs> Can't we all get along, boys and girls? No! I came to bring a sword. It's going to divide daughter and mother, son and father. He was not Mr. Rogers. Can you say kindness, boys and girls? I mean, look, he was kind most of the time, but he certainly didn't go around saying, this sermon brought to you by the letter Q. No, Jesus was tough. In fact, why did they kill Jesus? Two major reasons. Number one, he claimed to be God. That's blasphemy to the Jews and sedition to the Romans. And number two, he spoke truth to power. And the temple authorities didn't like that. They knew they, that this guy was going to put them out of business. That's why Jesus was killed. Jesus was tough. He was not a wimpy guy. By the way, I've noticed one other thing about judging. Do you ever notice when you, when you compliment somebody, which is a judgment, nobody gets upset? You know, if you say to your best friend, I really love you. You're such a wonderful person. You think your friend's going to go, who do you think you are? Are you judging me? Do you think you're worse than me? No, your friend's never going to say that, right? 
I've noticed that people really don't have a problem with judging. They just have a problem with judgments they don't like. In fact, if you tell somebody something that's true and they get upset with you, you just help convict them. As Augustine said, we love the truth when it enlightens us. We hate the truth when it convicts us. A few military people in here, and by the way, I was in the Navy, which stands for never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> for you military people in here, you always get more flack when you're over the target. If you tell somebody something that's true and they're shooting back at you, you're over the target. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. Jesus said men love darkness rather than light. So we have to make judgments without being judgmental. One evangelist put it this way. He said evangelism is just one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. There is nobody in this room or outside this room that can merit their way to God. We're all fallen. We all need a savior. That's why we shouldn't be judgmental. Now, we could spend more time on self-defeating statements. We don't have time. I just want to point one thing out. Can everybody see that this statement right here shoots itself? Can everybody see that? And so do all the other statements we went through, like all truth is relative. There are no absolutes. All truth comes from science. You ought not judge. These are all self-defeating statements. So there is truth out there. The question is, is it true that God exists? That's the next question. Now, before we get there, i got to say one thing, because a little bit later we'll bring out the uh, mic for Q&A. And um, I may ask you a question, especially if you're not a Christian, if you're an atheist, I may ask you a question. It's not fair to me to ask you a question on the spot, so I want to give you a heads up. Here's the question I might ask you. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand in front of the microphone, in front of hundreds of people, including last night at Purdue, and I ask that question, and they say, no. No? Wait. I thought you claimed to be reasonable. How's that reasonable? You wouldn't believe something if it were true? Well, it's not reasonable. The problem isn't here. The problem's here. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because they want to be God. They want to be God of their own lives. You see, most of us, we're not on a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest. And we're just going to believe whatever we think is going to make us happy. Here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term, doing a lot of fun but ultimately destructive things, yet over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in this room over 40 knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves, right? The only way to get ultimate contentment is to go straight through truth, and Jesus is the truth. So think about that question. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If you hesitate or you say no, the problem is not in the mind. The problem's in the will. But let's move on to the next question. Is it true that God exists? Does God exist? I mentioned, and we're going to spend the majority of our time actually on point two because um, it's an important question. Um, I mentioned that we're going to go through three arguments. Here are the three arguments for a theistic God. These are all in the book. The first is from the beginning of the universe known as the cosmological argument. Cosmological comes from the Greek word, Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. It says if the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. The second uh, argument is from design, known as the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. And it says if there's design in the universe and design in you, a living thing, there must be a designer. Now, these two arguments have some scientific evidence behind them. We'll see some of that. The third argument doesn't have any science behind it, yet it's the argument every single person in this room has known since you were a very small child, and it's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says if there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to murder six million people in a holocaust, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity, then everything's just a matter of opinion. That's just your opinion against the baby torturer's opinion or your opinion against Hitler's opinion. But since we know those things really are wrong, there must be a standard of righteousness beyond us. And that standard of righteousness, goodness, and love is what we mean by God's nature. Okay, We'll get to that later. We've got to start right here at the cosmological argument. Now, you've got to admit, it was worth coming out here tonight just to see God do that. I mean, did you see that? Did you see the way God just floated right? Let's take another look at that, can we? Look at that. 
Now, this is the argument that many say points back to the big... Now, some of you are going, uh, Frank, you know, we're Christians in here. Uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. In fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even atheistic scientists are admitting the data for it. For example, Stephen Hawking, who was the top physicist in the world until he died a few, couple of years ago, put it this way. He said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, Hawking tried to come up with another explanation other than God. He failed, but he's admitting the data that space, time, and matter literally had a beginning out of nothing. A colleague of his, an agnostic astronomer by the name of Alexander Vilenkin, who teaches at Tufts University, put it this way after looking at all the evidence. He said, with the proof now in place, cosmologists, and by the way, a cosmologist is not someone that puts on your makeup, <laughs> right? A cosmologist is someone that studies the origin of the universe. Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, there's a couple of words in here I want to highlight. Usually, scientists don't use the word proof because it's, science is tentative. But Vilenkin thinks that so many lines of evidence cross at one point, he's calling it a proof. He also says it's a problem. Why? Because if space, time, and matter literally had a beginning out of nothing, there's no natural cause that, that can account for it because all of nature was created. Now, Vilenkin, again, is not a Christian. He's not even an, a theist. He's an agnostic. He doesn't know. But he's admitting what appears to be the data for the first miracle. Now, we're not going to go through the data. Why? Number one, we don't have time. Number two, it's all in the book. And number three, it's not controversial. Even the atheists are admitting it. If you want to ask about it during the Q&A, you can. I just want to jump to the bottom line, the implication of this. And it's this. If the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. We got two options. Either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable? No one created something out of nothing, or someone created something out of nothing. Well, I was at Texas A&M probably 10 years ago. I put a slide like this up, and an atheist said, oh, I think number one is more reasonable. I said, time out. Let's look at number two. Number two says someone created something out of nothing. Now, that is a miracle, right? But at least you got someone. Number one is a miracle with no miracle worker. That's clearly absurd. By the way, do you realize that everybody, regardless of your worldview, believes in at least one miracle? Christians believe in that someone created something out of nothing. Atheists are believing that no one created something out of nothing. Now, I said to the audience that night at Texas A&M, I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality. By the way, the law of causality doesn't say everything has a cause. The law of causality says everything that comes to be has a cause. There's got to be an uncaused first cause. It's either the universe or something outside the universe. But there's got to be what Aristotle would call the unmoved mover. There's got to be an uncaused first cause. Okay? So I said to the audience at A&M, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality, that things don't pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. There is nobody in this auditorium here tonight who is currently worried that as you sit here, a hippopotamus has appeared out of nothing, by nothing, in your dorm room, and is currently pooping on your pillow. Right? You're not worried about that. You're not worried that a bull elephant is just going to appear in this room right now out of nothing and charge over people, right? You don't worry about those things because you know that things don't pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. And if the whole universe could do so, why doesn't everything do so? Why don't Teslas pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause? You wake up one morning, your Toyota Corolla is a Tesla. And you go, man, how do I charge this thing? You know. <laughs> why don't MacBook Pros pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause? Could have saved me four grand. If you're hungry after this seminar tonight and you want to have a pizza, does it make sense to order one? Or should you just sit in your room and wait and hope one pops into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause? No, it seems to me the atheists have all the faith. Space, matter, and time had a beginning. Now, what could have caused 
space, matter, and time. It seems to me if space, matter, and time had a beginning, whatever caused space, matter, and time has to be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create. Why personal? Because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice, and only persons make choices. Impersonal forces don't make choices. The being would also have to be intelligent in order to make a choice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? You say God. But how do you know it's the Christian God? We don't. Yet, we haven't done enough research yet. This could be Allah or some other theistic or deistic God. We're just saying that it has the attributes of what could be the Christian God. In order to see if this is the Christian God, we've got to go through the rest of these points. And we've got to see if Jesus was who he said he claimed to be. And if that's really true. And I think when we do, we'll realize that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,987 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. But we haven't gotten there yet. Now, here's a question to ask an atheist. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? In other words, if there is no God, why does anything exist? That's a question the philosopher Leibniz uh, posed a couple hundred years ago. Why is there anything if there's no God? There's more in the book on that. We've got to go to the next argument, though, the teleological argument, the design argument. And I mentioned there are two aspects to this. One is the design of the universe, and the other is the design of life. Let's look at the universe first. Scientists have discovered in recent decades that the universe is fine-tuned. That if you were to change any one of a number of factors about our universe, virtually imperceptibly, there'd either be no universe or no universe that could support life. Let me just give you two of probably a dozen of these things. The first is from Stephen Hawking, again the atheist, who put it this way. He said, if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. You change the expansion rate, that infinitesimal amount, none of us are here. Now, you can't make any sort of evolutionary kind of explanation for this. Why? You can't say, well, it just evolved to this point. Because this is the initial expansion rate. It started that way. Seems to me the same being that created space, matter, and time is the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate from the very beginning so we could be here right now. Also, the gravitational force, if it were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power, we wouldn't be here. What's one part in 10 to the 40th power? That's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I, so let me give you a tape measure or give you an example using a tape measure. Take a tape measure and stretch it across the entire known universe. That's a long way. You can't get that tape measure at Lowe's. Set the gravitational force at a particular inch mark on that tape measure. I realize gravity is not measured in inches. This is just to give you a scale idea in your mind. If the strength of gravity were different by one inch in either direction across the scale as wide as the entire known universe, we wouldn't be here. I don't have enough faith to believe that that value just landed there by chance. And oh, by the way, is chance a cause? Does chance cause things? Who caused this? Chance. He was just here. No. Chance is not a cause. Chance is a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. Chance doesn't do anything. In fact, when scientists are using the word chance, you know what they really mean? We don't know. Look, there's only two possibilities with regard to this value. Either this value was designed or it wasn't. What's more reasonable? Seems to me it was designed. Now, there's many more of these factors. We don't have time to get into them. But you can also make the argument that our solar system was designed with us in mind. In fact, let's take a look at our solar system here for just a second. This keeps people awake, okay? Okay. Here we are, third rock from the sun. If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away, can we turn that down? You can't? Can we go in here and turn it down? Go ahead. Take your time. We got time. Because otherwise, I'm going to lose my mind. (laughs) Anyway, 
If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away from the sun, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It is, that's a lie. It's too cold here in the winter. Okay, I live in Charlotte. This is too cold, all right? The axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees. Change that slightly. We don't need this. Thank you. Give that man a hand right there. Yeah. Yeah. You can turn it up a little bit. That little ambiance we had going there. A little rumble. The axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees. Change that slightly. We don't exist. Earth rotation, 24 hours. Change that slightly. We don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us. Change that slightly, we don't exist. In fact, if Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't be here. What does Jupiter do for us? It's a cosmic vacuum cleaner. Its gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, you see these purple marks here? Oh, you can turn it down now. Thank you. See these purple marks here? Those purple marks are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Look, the universe is fine-tuned, the sound system is not. Okay, I'm just letting you know, all right? Thank God for Jupiter, because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. In fact, you want to see the size of Jupiter, check this out. Just turn it way down. Just put it in Dolby. Whoa. I, I think we're starting to register on the Richter scale right now. Okay, there's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth, Pluto. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. Take a look at this. That's good. That's a good, that's a good level right there. Look, you can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus right there, another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto, forget about it. All right, keep an eye on Arcturus now. Where's Arcturus now? Way over here. That's Antares. That's another star in our galaxy. The sun is one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. The heavens are awesome. And that's just in our galaxy. This is not outside our galaxy. This is just inside our galaxy. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles. And all that distance is necessary for us to exist here on Earth. Now, how far is 30 trillion miles? Far. Yes. Take you at least two tanks of gas and a Toyota Prius <laughs> to go 30 trillion miles. A number of years ago, my wife and I took uh, our sons out to the Desert Museum in Tucson, Arizona. And we were out there one night. It was so clear that night that the guide said, if we look up at 9.03, we'll see the space shuttle in orbit. He said, come on, we're not going to see the space shuttle. It's only 120 feet long. It's 350 miles up. We're not going to see it. Oh, me of little faith. At 9.03, the guide goes, look! And we look up in the sky. There's an object streaking across the western desert sky relative to us about like this. When it got right about here, it disappeared. I don't know whether Scotty beamed it up or what. <laughs> Actually, what happened was, despite the fact that we were in total darkness, the space shuttle was so high up that the sun was still reflecting off of it. When it got out of the range of the sun, we couldn't see it anymore. Now, when the space shuttle was in orbit, the space shuttle was traveling at about 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to school in the morning? Take the space shuttle. You'll be here five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation to try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star in our galaxy an average distance away 30 trillion miles. In other words, how long would it take us to go 30 trillion miles if we could go five miles per second? How long? What do you think? 
long time. You must be a math major. Huh? <laughs> it would take us 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star in our galaxy, an average distance away, you've been going five miles a second for 2,000 years, you'd be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. <laughs> we're not going anywhere in space. It took us nine years to get to Pluto. There's no way we're going to get out there in space. It's not happening. Now, if you think our galaxy is impressive, the Hubble Space Telescope has done some very impressive photography. In fact, a number of years ago, they trained the Hubble Space Telescope on 1 24 millionth of the sky. What's 1 24 millionth of the sky? Go outside tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, that piece of rice, if you hold it up at arm's length, would represent about one twenty-four millionth of the sky. What did Hubble find when they looked at that one twenty-four millionth of the sky? I'm going to show you right here. And I don't know if you can see this here in this graphic, but these are mountains down here. And this is the southern sky in the southern hemisphere. I'm going to show you the video. It's actually a bunch of pictures just put together. I'm going to show you the video from Hubble Ultra Deep Field. You're going to see the constellations come up, and then it's going to zoom in on 1 24 millionth of the sky. There is no audio. It's just video. Are you ready? Here we go. There are the constellations. you're looking at are nearly 10,000 galaxies. The prophet Isaiah, writing in chapter 40, verse 25, has God speaking, and here's what God says. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One. In other words, you want to know what I'm like? Here it is. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these stars and named them one by one because of his great power and mighty strength? Not one of them is missing. In other words, you want to know what God is like? Look to the heavens. How many stars are out there? The number of stars that are out there are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth. And to go from one grain of sand to another grain of sand going five miles a second in our galaxy will take you over 200,000 years. Psalm 103, verse 11 says, God's love to those that fear him exceeds the height of the heavens above the earth. How high are the heavens above the earth? Infinite. That's the point. Now, ladies and gentlemen, since we have a creator of this magnitude, is it possible that this being has a reason for a tragedy you've gone through, even though you don't know what that reason is. But as amazing as the heavens are, they're not nearly as amazing as you are. Why? Because the heavens aren't made in the image of God, but you are. In fact, this is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is that animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? It's human. Now, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? It doesn't mean you look like God. He's an immaterial being. It means you're a person like God. You have mind, emotion, and will. You know, you feel, you want. You can create like God. And as an imager of God, you're representing him here in this world. 
He calls you to represent him. That's what it means to be an imager. And you started here. Actually, you started before this. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. When your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed your egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States, 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg, and then there was a race, and you won. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. You beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. Now, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fascist soldier in the gene pool, but you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.2 billion letter genome that makes you you. That software program, all the letters in the right order. Your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, yet it contained the other half of the 3.2 billion letter genome that makes you you. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. Do you know you have not received any more genetic information from this point until right now? In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, wait a minute, Frank. Come on, you can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this. This was actually the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law which doesn't le legislate morality. The only question is, whose morality will be legislated? And when people say to me, Frank, don't impose your morality on me, I say, why not? Would that be immoral? Because you're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying I ought not impose ought nots, but you're putting an ought not on me right now. But actually, the better answer is this. If somebody says, don't impose your morality on me, I say, this isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder's wrong, that abortion's wrong, that rape is wrong, that theft is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men. And the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This is not your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law of the law written on their hearts. So if you have a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with the creator on whose nature this morality is based. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point until right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For most of you, anyway. Some cells became brain cells, others heart cells, others lung cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this day. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red... Knock it off! Are you thinking about this? Are you going, Frank, time out. I got to concentrate. New red blood cells coming. No. This is just happening. You say, how is it happening? Aristotle recognized something 2,400 years ago. He noticed that all of nature is going in a direction. I mean, consider an acorn. 
Why does an acorn, if it's properly nourished, always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a seahorse? You say, well, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Yeah, well, who programmed it? And is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground going, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No, but it reliably goes in the direction of becoming an oak tree. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. That is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God, that all of nature's going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, it must have a director. Now notice, this argument has nothing to do with the Big Bang or any of that. This is not a cause way back then. It's a cause every single second of existence. That there's a sustaining cause that keeps all the natural laws going in the direction they go in, consistently and precisely. This is why in the Stealing from God book, I say science actually needs God. Why? Because it needs somebody to create these natural laws and sustain them consistently. Without them, we couldn't do science. We couldn't have cause and effect relationships. Now, there's a lot more in the book on that. We don't have time to get into it. But that argument shows that there has to be a sustaining cause, not just a beginning cause. Now, we've got to move on to our, well, before we do, I've got to tell you about C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says everything well. You might be thinking, well, atheists have a, a counter-argument for this. Actually, they don't, and if they did, you shouldn't believe it. You say, why? Because atheism makes reason impossible. Follow me on this. Well, you're not following me. You're following Lewis. This is a, a two-page quote. You ready? Here we go. Suppose there were no intelligence behind the universe. In that case, nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. Thought is merely the byproduct of some atoms within my skull. But if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? You got it so far? He continues, but if I can't trust my own thinking, of course I can't trust the arguments leading to atheism and therefore have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God, I can't believe in thought, so I can never use thought to disbelieve in God. Boom. I wish I had that quote before I wrote Stealing from God. That would have been the whole chapter. That's what I'm trying to say. If we're nothing but moist robots, as the atheists claim we are, why should we think anything we believe is true? We're not reasoning to conclusions based on the evidence. We're just driven there by the laws of physics. So there's no reason to believe anything is true. I mean, some atheists... Are I mean, all atheists don't believe in God. The problem is they don't believe in humans either. Why? Because we're not human beings with free will if this is true. We're just moist robots. There's more in the Stealing from God book. But we've got to go to the third argument, the moral argument. And by the way, this argument we're about to go, to th go, to go through right now might be the most relevant argument of them all. Why? Because people can ignore the beginning. They can ignore design. It's really hard to ignore morality. You deal with it every day. Let's say you go out on a hike somewhere and you get lost. Way out in the forest somewhere, you get turned around. Your cell phone's dead. You know the direction from which you came, but you can't find it right now. All you have to get home is a magnetic compass. And you know a magnetic compass is always supposed to point to magnetic north. So if you can find out where north is, you can get home. But instead of this compass pointing to magnetic north, your compass, no matter which way you turn, always points to you. How helpful would that compass be? That's not helpful at all. You know where you are. You're trying to figure out where north is. What well, question? Why do we think that if the compass of life doesn't always point to us, in other words, if things aren't going just our way, either God doesn't exist, he's evil, or he's forgotten about us. Do you realize that whether or not God exists you are not the center of the universe, and neither am I, yet we act like we are. And by the way, is there a moral compass? Is there a right way to live, or do you get to live however you want? You know, without purpose, there is no right or wrong way to live. This Sunday, when the Chiefs play the uh, 49ers, 
The only way you could know if your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing an interception is if you know what? If you know the purpose of the game. If there's no purpose of the game, you can't tell whether a touchdown is better than an interception. you got to have purpose to know if something's good or bad, either practically or even morally. What's the purpose? So do we determine right and wrong or do we discover right and wrong? Discover, yeah, but our culture says, no, 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 you don't discover right and wrong. You determine what's right for you. I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota about four years ago. I was going through all this material in a lot more depth than what we can do right now. We had several nights there. The second night I was there, we had the, the uh, microphone set up for Q&A, and a couple of young men in their 20s got up to the microphone, and they were atheists. I didn't think anything of it. We just had a nice conversation. The next night we were there, about a 50-year-old man got up to the microphone, and he had a question written on two sheets of paper, and he began to read the question. 20 seconds into reading, really 10 seconds into reading the question, he just broke down crying. He couldn't go any further. So I walked off the platform, I went down to him, and all he did was he handed me the two sheets of paper and he said, read it, read it. So I began to read the question as I'm walking back up to the platform. By the time I got back up to the platform, I realized that that man, whose name turned out to be Steve, was upset for two reasons. Reason number one, Steve had recently learned that a supposed friend of his, another 50 or, so year old, 50 or so year old man by the name of Tom, had been sexually abusing Steve's daughter from the time she was age four to the time she was age 14, right in his own home, under his nose, never saw it. The second reason Steve was upset was because the two young men who were there the night before were atheists, and they were his sons. And they used to be Christians. But as soon as they heard about the news as to what happened to their sister, they said there is no God. A good God never would have allowed this to happen to our sister. In fact, one of them was going to a Roman Catholic seminary to become a priest. And he walked out of the seminary. He said, that's it. I'm done with God. There is no God. So I said to Steve, I said, Steve, you know, it's okay to be mad at God. In fact, some of the Bible writers are mad at God. Read Habakkuk. Read Lamentations. Read some of the Psalms. Now, this is not a good long-term strategy. But God can take it. Do you realize, by the way, that you can curse God all day and you're not going to hurt him? He's an infinite being. You can praise him all day and you're not going to help him. He's an infinite being. So why does he want you to praise him and not curse him? For whose benefit? For yours. It's because he loves you. So I said, Steve, This actually does not disprove God. It actually shows that God does exist. And I said, when the time is right, I want you to say this to your sons. If there is no God, then the man who did this to your sister wasn't really wrong. It's just your opinion. Because if there is no right and wrong, if there is no true compass, you can't say he had the wrong compass, right? I mean, where did his compass point? It pointed to him. If there's no true compass, you can't say he has the wrong compass. And I said, this does not disprove God. It actually shows God does exist. Why? Because this wouldn't even be wrong unless there was a standard of good. But a standard of good doesn't exist unless God exists. Not an objective standard anyway. You see, evil doesn't disprove God. Evil may prove there's a devil out there. But evil can't disprove God because... Evil only shows that good must exist, and good shows that God must exist. Why? Because evil doesn't exist on its own. It only exists as a lack in a good thing. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a body, what do you have? You've got a better body. If you take all the body out of the cancer, what do you got? Nothing. It doesn't exist on its own. You take all the rust out of a car, you've got a better car. If you take all the car out of the rust, what do you have? Just a rust spot on the pavement. In other words, evil doesn't exist on its own. It only exists in a good thing. And C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist early on in his life, because he thought there was too much injustice in the world, realized he made a mistake, and he ultimately corrected his mistake in in the book, Mere Christianity. Here's what he said. As an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? 
You see, you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know what unjustice was unless you knew what justice was. You could look at it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you have to have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil, but you can't have shadows without sunshine. You can't have evil without good. I know this sounds counterintuitive, but if evil exists, God exists. Now, you can ask the question, why would God allow it to continue? That's another question. We deal with that a little bit in stealing from God. But what you can't say is it disproves him because nothing would be evil unless God existed because he is the standard of good. Now, the guy who did this in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, everyone knows he's guilty, but he's not in jail. Why? Because every time the trial comes up, Jessica, the girl who was abused, psychologically checks out. She can't testify against him. She wanted to marry him. She didn't know. If she doesn't testify, he doesn't go to jail. So I said, Steve, when the right time comes, I want you to say this to your sons. If there is no God, then the man who did this to your sister will never get justice. He's not going to get justice here in this life if she doesn't testify. And he's not going to get justice in the afterlife because according to atheism, there is no afterlife. Do you really think that's the way reality is? Do you really think there's no such thing as justice? The very reason you're upset, rightfully so, is because you know a great injustice has been done. But there can't be injustice unless there's justice. And by the way, the only being that can ensure justice is an all-knowing, all-powerful being who can correct these things. See, atheism doesn't take away the pain. It only takes away the hope. Now, Jessica, the one who was abused once she hit 18, wrote a book. Here it is. Not Your Princess by Jessica Mitzel. I read one chapter of this book. I couldn't read any more. In fact, you can get it on Amazon. Now, why am I telling you this? Because her father, Steve, wants as many people to know that this happens too often in American households. Adults, if a young person ever comes to you and says, Uncle Joe did this to me, do not dismiss it. Oh, Uncle Joe would never do that. How do you know? You think the kid's making it up? Jessica's getting emails from other kids who have nowhere to turn. They're being abused. I had contact with Steve about a year and a half ago. I said, how's Jessica? She's 19 or 20 at the time. He said she's still in a treatment program in, Sa in San Diego, California. $15,000 per month. She has multiple personalities, which is common with this kind of abuse. You know, our culture tells us that sex is just physical. That's a lie. If sex is just physical, why is Jessica in a treatment program at $15,000 a month? If sex is just physical, why is it worse if somebody rapes you than if somebody just physically assaults you? If sex is just physical, why is it if your spouse goes out and has a sexual relationship with somebody, you don't go, oh, that's just physical, because you know it's not. There's so much more to sex than the physical. It's emotional. It's spiritual. It's moral. It's psychological. You have sex with somebody, everything changes forever. Sex is like fire. You put it in your fireplace, it's wonderful. It'll warm you. You get it anywhere else in your house, it will burn your house down. Maybe not immediately, but over the long term it will. And those of us over 40 knows what I'm talking about, don't we? The bottom line to this whole thing is God's nature is morality's true north. If God doesn't exist, you can't say sexual abuse of children is wrong. That's just your opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, is the sexual abuse of children wrong? Then God exists. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it's not. Now, what can we do with these three arguments? What have we learned? From these three arguments, I think we can determine that there is a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent, moral creator who created all things and sustains all things to this very moment. We haven't even opened the Bible yet, and we have the attributes of the God of the Bible. Now, how do we know it's the God of the Bible? We still don't know yet. But how could we find out? We have to go to the next question, and that is, are miracles possible? Now, this question does not take long, actually. This will be the shortest one. Are miracles possible? 
why, why would miracles help us here? Because miracles are used to tell someone that this guy speaks for God. Moses can do miracles. He must speak for God. Jesus and the apostles can do miracles. They must speak for God. That's the purpose of miracles in the Bible quite frequently. The problem is a lot of people today believe miracles are impossible. Like, for example, Noah and the ark. All right, Christians, this is just for Christians in here. Don't let this get out of the room, even though we are streaming this. Christians, can we agree on one thing? Can we agree? And I think the atheists would agree too. Noah and the ark is crazy. Can we admit that? Thank you. And for example, I think a resurrection is crazy too. How many people in here have seen a resurrection? No, I haven't seen one either. Yet the entire Christian belief system is based on believing something none of us have ever seen. How rational is that? And for some reason, the big problem miracle in the Bible is Jonah. Is that a whale of a tail or a tail of a whale? I mean, what does it deal with Jonah? Can you really believe in Jonah? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? It's not the resurrection. The resurrection's easy compared to the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle in the Bible is... I got some of you a second time. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? I mean, if it's true that God created the universe out of nothing, can he do whatever he wants? It's not logically impossible inside the universe? Of course. Can he resurrect the dead if he can create the universe out of nothing? Can he walk on water? Can he part the Red Sea? Can he do Noah and Jonah? Of course Noah and Jonah are crazy, unless God exists of course he can do these things. Now, here's the interesting thing. Atheists are actually admitting the data for the first verse. Again, they don't think it's God, but what else could it be? They're admitting it. Well, if that's the case, these other verses are at least possible. You can't philosophically rule it out. There was an atheist last night at Purdue who said, I can't believe this because it's got miracles in it. I said, look around. You're living in a miracle. This universe is a miracle. Now, Despite the fact that most of us haven't seen miracles, and a lot of people will say, I can't believe in miracles because I've never seen them, I want to say that's not necessarily a good reason to disbelieve something. Why? Because you believe in a lot of things you've never seen. You believe in your mind. Have you ever seen it? You're using it right now, I hope. You believe in the laws of logic. Have you ever seen those? You're using them right now. You believe in love. Have you ever seen love? No, you may have loved somebody, you may have been loved, but you've never seen love. Why? It's not a physical thing. It's an immaterial reality. I had a couple of debates years ago with Christopher Hitchens. You guys know who Christopher Hitchens was? He was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. <laughs> and we're at the College of New Jersey, and during the Q&A, a student asked Hitchens this question. Christopher, what is love? And Christopher, being a materialist, a moist robot, had to say... That love is a chemical. To which I said, don't say that to your wife. Honey, do you love me? I don't know. Let me see if I got the chemical. Yeah, I got it today. I don't know if I'll have it tomorrow. Love isn't a chemical. It's an immaterial virtue. And the essence of love is God's nature. And that's why he expresses it to us through Christ. You've never seen gravity Oh, Frank, come on. No, no, no. We have seen gravity. Look at this. There's gravity right there. Nope. You're not seeing gravity. What are you seeing? You're seeing the effects of gravity. We don't even know what gravity is. Do you know that? We're seeing its effects. And by the way, that's how we know God exists. We reason from effect to cause. We see effects of God. We see a creation. That's the effect. We reason back to a cause, a creator. We see design. That's the effect. We reason back to a cause, a designer. We have a moral law written on our hearts. That's the effect. We reason back to a Moral lawgiver. This is what scientists do. They find effects and they reason back to the cause. You've never seen George Washington. You believe in him. Why? Because he's left effects behind that are best explained by the person known as George Washington. Same thing is true of Jesus. You've never seen him. Maybe you have. I don't know. I haven't. But why do I believe in him? Because he's left effects behind that are best explained by the person known as Jesus. So don't buy into this idea that because you've never seen something, you don't believe in it. You believe in a lot of things you've never seen. And by the way, if miracles do occur, and there doesn't need to be a miracle since Jesus and the apostles for Christianity to be true. 
Now, I think miracles have occurred since then. In fact, my friend Craig Keener at Asbury Seminary has written a hernia-inducing two-volume set called Miracles, modern-day miracles. You can look into that. But the point is, is that if miracles occur, they have to be very rare. Why? Because if they occurred all the time, they wouldn't get our attention. For example, suppose people rose from the dead routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean to us? Nothing. You go to somebody, you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. The guy goes, so what? Uncle Joe just rose from the dead two weeks ago. Now I got to give the inheritance back. No, it's got to be a rare event. It can't be a regular event. Miracles have to be rare if they're going to get our attention. So you shouldn't expect to see a lot of miracles. But the greatest miracle has already occurred, the creation of the universe out of nothing, so other miracles are possible. And with that, we got to move on to the final question, is the New Testament true? We're not trying to see if it's inerrant or any of this or if it's, a, if it's inspired. All we want to see is if one event from the ancient world took place, and that is the resurrection of Jesus. Because if that took place, game over, Christianity is true. Now I'm going to give you six, uh, sorry, eight lines of evidence that all begin with the letter E. We don't have time to look into all of them. I'm just going to list them and we'll look at two of them, all right? They all begin with the letter E. We have early sources. The New Testament is written early and it has early sources in it. It's got eyewitness details throughout that only an eyewitness would know. It has embarrassing stories in it. I'll explain that in a minute. It also has excruciating deaths. We'll look at that one as well. It has embedded confirmation. Now, this is hard to explain in a short period of time, so let me just say, this is probably the best evidence you've never heard of that the New Testament writers are independently witnessing the same historical events. And the way you can research this is just Google two words, undesigned coincidences. Undesigned coincidences. And it's an undesigned coincidence that the lights have just gone out, either that or I have a brain tumor. What happened to our lights? Huh? Are we past curfew? Well, you guys can see this, right? All right, let's just keep going. Also, there's expected predictions. Those at home, it's dark here. Expected predictions, that deals with Old Testament prophecy. If I only had one Old Testament prophecy to make my case on, it would be Isaiah chapter 53. Also, there are extra biblical writers People like Suetonius, Thallus, Phlegon, these household names you've probably heard of. There's about 10 of them within 150 years of Jesus' life. And when you put their references together, you get a story congruent with the New Testament. Uh, finally, there's the explosive growth of the church uh, in, well, thank you, let there be light. There's the explosive growth of the church in Jerusalem or out of Jerusalem, which is really hard to explain because there were two groups that didn't want Christianity to emerge out of Judaism in, in the first century from Jerusalem. And those two groups would be the Romans and the Jews, and they could have stopped it easily by doing one thing. Look what they have done. They could, have take, they could have gone to the tomb and taken Jesus' body out. It would have end, ended Christianity right there. They couldn't do that. Why? Because the tomb was empty. It's really hard to explain Christianity from Judaism if the tomb wasn't empty. So we don't have time to cover all these. Let's, uh, let's start with embarrassing stories. We'll just look at a couple of them. What are embarrassing stories? Historians judge something to be true if it's embarrassing to the author or authors. They say, look, if it's embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why do you think it would be true? Because you're not going to invent embarrassing things, right? You won't, in other words, you won't lie to make yourself look bad. You might lie to make yourself look good, but you won't lie to make yourself look bad. In fact, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? If you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying to make yourself look good and it's not working. We know you're lying. All right, how many people have ever lied to make yourself look bad? No, you don't do that. You might lie to make yourself look good, but you won't lie to make yourself look bad unless you're a pool shark or something temporarily, right? Well, the New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing stories that make them look bad that they never would have invented. That's why we call this the dove factor. They're not making this up. Let me just give you a few of them, of many. Peter, the leader of these new disciples, is called Satan by Jesus. Do you think they invented this? 
Do you think Mark, who wrote this down at one point, said to Peter, Hey, Pete, I'm going to make this a real interesting story. I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. What do you think Peter would have said? Have him call you Satan. Look, I'm the leader here. This doesn't look good. And then Peter says, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He denies him three times after saying he never would. And then at the crucifixion, all the disciples, maybe with the exception of one, they all run away. This is like a Monty Python movie. Run away! They're all cowards. And who are the brave ones? The women. The women are the brave ones. Now, who wrote the New Testament down? Men. Now, what man is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb? Would any man here invent that? No way. I mean... If I was inventing it, I'd make myself look good, wouldn't you? <laughs> and I'm not looking good right now. Actually, I probably look better since you can't see me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thanks, brother. All right, where were we? We're talking about, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, what will, if, if I was making this up, I'd make myself look bad, uh, look good. I'd write something down like this. Let's see. We marched right down there, and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. That sounds pretty good. What do you think? Yep. And we saw Jesus, who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went and comforted the trembling women. I would never say it was Mr. Sissy Pants, why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb. And oh, by the way, why would you never say this in this culture? Forget the fact that it's embarrassing to men. It was. But independent of that, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses? Yes, because a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four Gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They really were. In fact, one of them was a formerly demon-possessed woman. Gee, what a great witness. I actually... I had a lady come up to me once. She said, Frank, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. <laughs> I said, that is an excellent point. I had not thought of that. Because ladies, when your man comes home, from, com comes home from work, does he say much? <laughs> there could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, hey, hon, what happened? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you the nuke blew up. I've been hot for three days. <laughs> What's for dinner? He's not going to tell you. I can't even believe this next passage is in the New Testament, but it is. You know the end of the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus is given the Great Commission? Where he says, go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say make believers. There's a difference, right? Anyway, all his disciples are there, and he's telling them to go do this. They're all there. And it says right there in the text about the disciples, some believed, but some doubted. He's standing resurrected right in front of them. And they're going, see that guy over there? Yep, that guy over there is Jesus. No, it can't be Jesus. He was just killed not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's him. It can't be him. He's dead. The Romans killed him. It's him. They know how to kill people. They crucified him. They put the spear in the side. Blood and water came out. I'm telling you, Jesus is dead. It's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? The women told me. <laughs> They're not making this up. There's even potentially embarrassing details about Jesus in there. In Mark chapter 3, it says his own family came to seize him and take him home because they thought he was nuts. Is he was out of his mind. That's embarrassing. And you may have heard the scholars say the New Testament writers embellish Jesus to be God. Really? Then why is Mark chapter 3 in there? Which is almost universally recognized to be the earliest gospel. That's embarrassing. And then Jesus is called a drunkard. He's called demon possessed. He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which he's going to been seen as a sexual advance. In fact, there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline. Rahab and Tamar. Do you think Matthew and Luke got together and said, you know what, I really think we ought to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let's put a couple of prostitutes in there. What do you think? In fact, there's a lot of shady people in the bloodline. Judah, from where we get the term Jew, not a good guy. Read about him. It's like Genesis 37, somewhere in there, 38. Uh, David, David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, I guess it's hope for the rest of us, huh? 
Bathsheba's in there. And you know, Matthew, when he gets to her in the genealogy, won't even mention her name. You know what he says instead? Uriah's wife. Ooh, that's a slam. But he's telling the truth. Who is Uriah? Husband of Bathsheba, whom David had killed so he could have Bathsheba. This is all embarrassing. But they're telling the truth. You don't make this stuff up. And there's more than this. We don't have time to go through them all. Let's do one more. How about excruciating deaths? This is the argument that says that these men who were in a position to know whether Jesus had resurrected or not died excruciating deaths when they could have saved themselves by saying it never happened. Here's a painting of Peter being crucified upside down. We don't exactly know if he was crucified upside down, but we have good evidence he was martyred in the first century, as well as James, as well as Paul. These are martyrs, and they didn't recant. Now, here's my question. Why would they do this? In fact, before we get into this, I've got to point out one thing. All the writers of the New Testament documents were baptized Jewish believers in Yahweh with the exception of Luke. Everyone else is a Jew. They already think they're God's chosen people. Question, what did they have to gain by making up a new religion? What did they get by saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? They got kicked out of the synagogue and then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, that was not a list of perks. We're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah. What's it going to get us? So first get kicked out of the synagogue and then we get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up. What a great idea. Why haven't we thought of this earlier? No, I don't think so. In fact, they had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did. Sometimes I get the question. Maybe you get the question. It goes like this. Are there any non-Christian writers that talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yeah, there are. I just mentioned them, and they're all in chapter 9 of the book. But you know what is sometimes underneath that question? An illicit assumption. What's the illicit assumption? You really can't trust the New Testament writers because, you see, they were, they were religious, and they embellished it. You can only look at the secular or non-Christian writers to figure out what really happened. If you think about that for more than five seconds, you realize how silly that is. What motive did these religious writers have to make this up? Nothing. They lost everything by saying it was true. In fact, my friend Jay Warner Wallace, the cold case homicide detective, who's been on Dateline more than any other detective in America for solving murders decades old says that whenever he finds a dead body that he knows has been murdered he says there's only three reasons why that guy's dead not a thousand reasons just three there was either a sex issue a money issue or a power issue sex money or power those are the universal motivators in fact if you think about this those are the reasons any of us sin we're trying to get those good things but we're trying to take a shortcut to get them and without those motivators, you don't have any kind of conspiracy. Question, did the New Testament writers, did it make them popular with the ladies for saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? No. Did they get money for saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? Did they get power for saying Jesus resurrected from the dead? No, they got the opposite. They got persecuted. In fact, Paul had all those things prior to... Becoming a Christian, as soon as he became a Christian, he lost his power and he was persecuted. There's no motive to make this up. In fact, why would they die for a known lie? You say, wait a minute, Frank, I know you think martyrdom proves Christianity, but don't you have to say that martyrdom would prove other religious worldviews, like, say, Islam? They have martyrs. No. Why? Because there's a big difference between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. There's many differences, but let me give you one for our purposes here. The Muslim martyrs haven't witnessed anything. They just have faith that Islam is true. The New Testament martyrs, on the other hand, witnessed Jesus rise from the dead. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they went to their deaths anyway. You see, many people will die for a lie they think is the truth. Nobody will die for a lie they know is a lie. And the New Testament writers were dying for an empirically verifiable claim, one that they verified with their own senses. Now, what I'm about to say here in summary of this section is going to sound like heresy for those of you in here who, like me, believe the Bible's inerrant. But it's not heresy. Just stick with me for a second, okay? Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. 
In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. See, how can that be? Because Christianity is not based on a book. Christianity is based on an event, the resurrection. Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Frank, how could you be a Christian without the book of Romans? Was Paul a Christian before he wrote the book of Romans? Yeah, he wrote the Christian because he was. Or he, wrote, he wrote the Romans because he was a Christian, because the risen Jesus appeared to him. Was John a Christian before he wrote the Gospel of John? Yeah, why? Because the risen Jesus appeared to John. That's why he wrote it. Same with the other writers, most of them anyway. In other words, you could put it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers you wouldn't even have a New Testament written by religious Jews in the first century unless Jesus rose from the dead. There's no motivation to do this. There's every motivation to say it didn't happen, not any motivation to say it did, unless it really did. So by the way, Christians, if you're a Christian in here, never say to somebody who's not a Christian, you ought to become a Christian because, because the Bible says so. That would be like a Muslim coming up to you and saying, you ought to be a Muslim because the Quran says so. You're going to go, I don't believe in the Quran. No, you've got to give them evidence that God exists and Jesus rose from the dead. Inerrancy is a conclusion. It's not a premise. You don't start there. The reason I believe the Bible's inerrant is because Jesus did. And I just have a personal policy. If somebody rises from the dead, I just trust whatever the guy says. So, there's more evidence. Again, you can get the books to go further. Let's sum up the whole thing. Does truth exist? The answer is, if somebody says there's no truth, you're going to say, is that, does God exist? We went through three arguments, cosmological, teleological, and moral. We get a bean with the attributes of God without even opening the Bible. Are miracles possible? What's the greatest miracle in the Bible? Creation, Genesis 1.1. If that verse is true, and even atheists are admitting the data for that verse then miracles are possible. And did Jesus rise from the dead? Sure seems so. We've got more evidence than we could cover tonight, but the answer is yes. So if you want to go further, you can get the books or the DVDs from our website. Again, you can text the word evidence to 44222. We're now teaching online courses. I'm teaching some online courses, as is Gary Habermas, the top guy in the world on the resurrection. Dan Wallace, one of the top manuscript experts, is teaching a course for us right now online and several other people as well. Check that out on our website. Uh, we're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. We're streaming this right now on YouTube and Facebook. And if you go to our uh, YouTube channel, uh, you'll see hundreds of videos from the college campus, lots of Q&A, which we're about to do here. Uh, and if you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, you'll, you'll see whenever a new video comes out. We put out one or two videos per day. So you can check that out. In fact, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've actually combined these three into one social media, plat media platform. We call it you twit face. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a Jersey thing. Have you signed up for you twit face yet? <laughs> we're on radio Saturday morning, and we're on DirecTV Wednesday night. And if you don't do anything else, download the free cross-examined app. Two words in the app store, cross-examined. And it's got not only the, uh, the app, or it has not only the podcast on it, it streams the TV show and has a quick answer section uh, to basic questions right there, all right? Now, it's true, so what? Before we take your questions, we kind of have to uh, land the plane here and say, okay, well, let's say Christianity's true. What does it mean to me? Well, you know what it really means? It means that somebody actually did die for you, Jesus of Nazareth. And that if you accept his free gift, you can have your sins forgiven and his righteousness given to you. When I was in the Navy, uh, I was in naval aviation, so we had to earn wings, which were hard enough to earn. But there's nothing more difficult in any military to earn than the golden trident. That's what the SEALs earn. Very few people that start SEAL training get through it, 5, 10, maybe 15%. Those that do get through the SEAL training and become SEALs wear that trident with pride. It is their identity. Very few people can wear it. When Michael Monsor was buried in Rosecrans Cemetery in San Diego, California, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. 
And when they showed up for his funeral, they took off their tridents and they pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and they put their identity in the one that died for them. That's what we're supposed to do. Our identity is in our creator and the one that died for us. But our culture will, ta- will say no. Put your identity in your political party or put your identity in your ethnic group or put your identity in your race. By the way, there's only one race, the human race. Or put your identity in your sexual orientation or your partner or your spouse or your bank account or your vocation or your school. None of those things are ultimate, ladies and gentlemen. The only way you're ever going to achieve contentment is to put your identity in your Savior, the one that not only died for you, but the one that rose again to offer you eternal life. Have you ever accepted that? If you haven't, why wouldn't you? If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? The answer is no, why not? What are you holding on to that you'd sacrifice even God and truth to keep? Last year when we were here at Ohio State, we went to a prison the next day to do some prison ministry. Actually, I think it was on another trip to Ohio, but it was about last March, and I went to this uh, prison, and the chaplain knew I was going to speak to two group of inmates, and he said, we'd like you to speak to a third group. Would you do it? I said, sure. Who are they? He said, the guys in solitary confinement. I said, we'll bring them up in prison, solitary confinement, known as the whole. So they brought about 20 of these guys up, and they were dressed in orange jumpsuits that I'm convinced you could see from space. These guys ever got out of that yard, we'd be able to track them via satellite. And they were, these guys were the hardened criminals. They had tattoos on their faces. I mean, think MS-13, right? So it's me in the room with these guys, and I go through some of this, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist material. And there's a guy in the back who's paying special attention, and at the end he goes, he raises his hand, and he goes, hey, man, this makes sense. And I said, I don't know why you're in here, but do you know that you can have the same identity as people on the outside have? Because in Christianity, you don't achieve your identity. You receive your identity. That's why the eyewitness John, who saw Jesus die and rise from the dead, said that he has given you the right to become a child of God. By trusting in what he's done. You don't achieve it. You receive it. That's why everyone who's a Christian is a brother and sister of one another. None of us are better than anybody else. Because we're all covered with the love and sacrifice of Christ. Why wouldn't you want to be a part of God's family? All right. With that being said. We're going to go to questions now. Thank you. And let me say, as uh, Clint, by the way, it's the great Clint Boland right here. He makes everything work when, uh, when the uh, university gives us lights, he can do his job. And, uh, and I want to say that um, Eric Chabot, who hosted this thing, where's Eric? Are you in here right now, Eric? Thank you so much for hosting this. And Eric, <laughs> tell... Uh, Tell everybody when they can meet uh, and discuss matters like this in more depth and have some fellowship. When is that? Tuesday at 7 p.m. at Anderson Classroom. It's over there. Let's get the information over there at the schedule. Tuesday, 7 p.m. where? Anderson Anderson. 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 You guys know where it is. You're Buckeyes. I don't know where it is. All right? Yeah, I don't know. By the way, um, if you would, if you would give us some feedback, 
you could give us some feedback by texting the word event to this phone number, 855-909-0582. 855-909-0582. It's going to text you back three simple questions, and you can tell us whatever you want, all right? All right. Yes, sir. Let's start here. What's your name? Uh, I'm Tony. Hey, Tony. How you doing? You were here last time, weren't you? Yes, I was. How you doing? I'm oh, just Oh, you're the guy with the great radio voice. Oh, I thank you. Who was an atheist. That's correct. Are you still an atheist? I am, yes. Tony, Tony, Tony. Tony oh, come yeah. on. You had a whole year, well, Tony. see. I'm coming back. A whole year. Maybe okay. you can help All me right. out. All we'll right. see. Okay. Go ahead, Tony. Um, so I, I wanted to begin by, uh, you mentioned Christopher Hitchens. Uh, yes. I know you debated him. Yes. And as you know, he, he had a very sharp wit in he his did. life. And I thought, um, in, in his spirit, I would note, uh, you said that uh, much of his brilliance was owed to his accent. But I thought it was worth pointing out that he sold more books in his lifetime. So there's that. Well, yeah, I, and actually, there's a lot of truth in his books. Well, I agree. Well, yeah. I, I don't like, I don't actually like Christopher Hitchens. Uh -huh. But I thought he was right about one thing, and this, and this happened to be but, a particular but remember, issue. remember, Tony, you know, why do people buy books? I don't really know. But if they like somebody, and look, I liked Hitchens. He was very likable. Right. I have his book. I, I didn't okay? mean, I was so. just telling a joke. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, wasn't, right. I wasn't putting it down or anything. Oh, all right. I'm, well, sure. no, I'm just trying to figure out yeah. why. Oh, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I actually began with that because um, I've had an epiphany recently, uh -huh. uh, understanding what it means when people talk about God. Mm -hmm. um, I recently, uh, and I don't mean to make anyone sad, but uh, a friend of mine two weeks ago had killed himself, um, and he was a Christian. He was uh, leading Bible studies a lot. Uh, there's never really been any explanation as to why he would have done that. Uh, at the same time, uh, I had another friend uh, who was an atheist who was uh, seriously considering suicide. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me in between this time that a lot of what people talk about when they are discussing God, and you did uh, a good job, I think, illustrating this point for me when you talked about morality, is they're talking about hope and something to live for or something, you know, you look at the universe and you think, wow, this is truly amazing. And people have this feeling that they need to uh, express somehow. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that is what religion ultimately is. You said that many of your doubts often tend to be emotional and that it varies right, according Tony. to the day. I'm sorry to hear about your friend. Um, we have a long line behind Okay, you, so you I'm sorry. Kind of so I'll make question. my point. Get to a yeah, question. Yeah, I'll make my point. Okay. Do you believe that it is possible to live a meaningful life without a belief in a God? Sure, but it'd be subjective meaning. It wouldn't be objective meaning. What, is, what do you mean? Well, objective meaning is grounded in the nature of God, his purposes. If we all just die and become worm food, there's no ultimate meaning. Well, that doesn't diminish the meaning of my life at all. I, it's true that I, as you said earlier, we might be wet machines, but my life isn't measured according to that at all. I can live a perfectly meaningful life as this meat robot, even though I don't have that perspective on it. So, right, for you personally. But right. if Hitler comes along and he says, Tony, you know, I'd really like to kill you because right. it would make me happy, is he wrong? Uh, he might feel that way, but it doesn't matter. I mean, my life is, in the meaning words, of your it, life yeah, is... Yeah, I know. In other words, though, is, is his meaning to kill you, if that's how he gets his meaning, is he wrong? It's not a question, it's not a factual question. Right. Well, it is he may He may derive meaning in that. Right. But it's just subjective meaning, in other words. It's his own subjective right. meaning against your own subjective meaning. What I'm saying is only if God exists is there objective meaning. Otherwise, life ultimately is absurd. And this is what the great existentialists have said, Camus and Sartre and others and Nietzsche. So, yes, you can have your own subjective meaning, just like Hitler can have his own subjective meaning to kill you, and you can have your own subjective meaning to do what you want to do, but it's not objective. I believe life in a, uh, is in a, has objective meaning. We all have our own nature and we live according to that. Um, we all work for our own self-satisfaction, but the things, and this is why I mentioned both of my friends, was that both, they both had similar problems. They both felt hopeless, but they responded in different ways, regardless of their religion. And that's what I think is what meaning is. It's that ability to look into yourself and find what it is that you take satisfaction from. And you are a subject. 
You're right. right. You can right. do that subjectively, but there's not there's no measuring standard outside of you unless God exists. That's what I'm saying. Uh, right. It is it is entirely your meaning is entirely dependent on you. And that's why I think that religion for many people, I think they have the mistaken idea that that's the only way they can get meaning in life. And I bring this up. I that's, was the, that's the only way they can get objective meaning. They can have There is no such thing as objective meaning. All is, values is, are is, subjective. Is, is that an objective statement you just made? No, no, it's not. Okay, well because then, to your perspective, it may well, very well be objective, but it's still ultimately dependent on you. When we talk about values, we're talking about the feelings of an individual. Okay, so it's objectively true that you have subjective values, but they're ultimately dependent on the individual. So basically what you're saying, Tony, is the, the pedophile Tom who abused that little girl, Jessica, that wasn't objectively wrong. No, it, it was objectively wrong because he was acting contrary to his nature as a human being. Oh, no, he wasn't. Oh, he, he was absolutely... acting right in accord with his compass. His subjective compass told him that's what he wanted. Why is he wrong if there's no standard beyond him? I'm not su There is an objective morality, but it's act no, no, wait, no, wait. One, no one in the normal course of their lives does something like that. It Tony, is Tony. in man's nature to be loving and peaceful toward other people. There are exceptions. I can, I know the audience doesn't believe that, but let me demonstrate that. No Tony. one in this room has managed to hit each other in spite that there are many people who are in disagreement. No one's swearing at each other. We all have peaceful nature. Okay. That man was acting contrary to his nature as a human being, and that is why it is immoral. Tony, do you have children? No, I don't. Okay, so you haven't been through the terrible twos. Okay. No, I haven't. Okay, don't so you don't have to tell a child to say mine. You have to teach them to share because our nature is bent toward evil. No, it's all not. All right, well. It's not. Child, do, no child goes out and does what the, the wicked things that adults do, right? No child, when, okay, when was the last time, when was the last time a child murdered someone, raped someone, kidnapped someone? It's an absurdity. The, if, if your children were really so violent, you would have them institutionalized. And there are some children like that, but the majority of people fundamentally do right. Okay, and the do wrong is the exception to the rule. But Tony, and this is the last thing, because we got a line behind. I understand. Okay. On one hand, a minute ago, you were saying there are no objective values, and now you're telling me that children do right. Now, which is it? I, th they don't always do right. What do you mean by right? As in acting according to their nature. As and, it, and whose nature? Mother Teresa's nature or Hitler's no, nature? No, our nature as human beings is reasoning animals, right? We all have our own, we all understand why we don't do that to each other because okay. we wouldn't have it done do what to us. To one another. What value are you talking about? The value of not doing violence onto each why other. Why is that wrong if there's no God? It's wrong because we would never have it done to us. So what? Why does, why does Hitler care if he kills you? He doesn't, but that's, okay. that's still why wrong. Why is he wrong? Is he, he wrong? Would, would Hitler approve of my killing him? What, what if, he's a, if he's enforcing a morality on me that he is not giving to himself, then he's suggesting that he's something other than human, right? Okay. So he's falling into contradiction because for, uh, he may steal from me, but he would never tolerate my stealing from him. All morality must be universal, as I believe the point of your presentation was. Well, it is universal, but it's grounded in the nature of God. But you admit not to God and man. Subjective. It's not because if you look in God. Okay, all right, Tony. Tony, please. Okay, why don't we do this? Why don't I'm happy to talk to you all night if you want to talk yeah. about it, but not I'm, in front of everybody right now. I apologize now. to the people behind me. Okay, so, so sure. let's but. hang around and you and I can talk more. Sure. But last thing, Tony. Last thing. I don't remember the answer to this question last yes. year. You would become a Christian. Yes. Did I give you a book last year? No. If I had a book, I'd give it. You give me your address, I'll send it to you. Oh, thanks. Okay? Uh, yeah. All right, thanks. Good, Tony. It's really good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And thank you, Tony. Yes, I have never heard of you until yesterday. I'm an old man, probably one of the oldest in here. You tell the truth. I've heard a lot of people. Thank you very much. And uh, Christianity is, in fact, true. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I don't even have to argue with you. That's pretty good. Yes, sir. What's yeah, your that name? was awesome. I'm up here way quicker than I thought I was going to be. What's so your name? Thanks to... Uh, my name is Daniel. Daniel. Um, I'm excited to talk to you because I first, I've never read your book, but I uh -huh. first heard about it when I was in college. And uh, 
the uh, title alone has been um, really intriguing to me. Well, Dan, you know I'm kind of spreading a rumor that you can't be saved unless you read the book. <laughs> okay, you're wrong. All so, right. um, I agree with most of what you said, but... Okay, all right, go ahead. All right. So, in John chapter 20, verse 24, we read the following. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with him. Though the doors were locked, sorry, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And I've always been worried with your book that you don't have enough faith to be an atheist, but I'm worried that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what do you take to be the role of faith as opposed to reason in, uh, in these sorts of arguments? Well, there's two kinds of faith. There's belief that and then there's belief in. Belief that is getting evidence that God exists, that Jesus rose from the dead. That's what apologetics is. That's what we're doing today. But belief in is knowing that after you know that it's true, trusting in what Jesus has done. And we know this in, in relationships. Like, for example, when I first met my wife 34 years ago, I got evidence that she would be a good wife, but all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife. I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. See? James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote the little book in the New Testament called? James. James, you guys are sharp tonight. He said that even the demons believe that God exists, but they tremble. In other words, they know intellectually better than we do that God exists, but they don't trust in him. Now open that Bible again to that same page, if you would, for a second, Daniel. Mm -hmm. And go down a little further and read verse 31. Uh, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, he put belief that and belief. Uh, 29. Mm -hmm. He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Isn't that belief that? No, that he, J Jesus. Because the, the issue is whether he rose from the dead. So Thomas is saying, I have to put my, my fingers in. Right, Your and Jesus polls. is saying that there's going to be people out there who are not going to have the same opportunity you have. Uh -huh. That doesn't mean they have no evidence. They have the witness of John. That's why he says in that verse 31, I'm writing these things down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and by believing in him, you may have life in his name. Right. That's what the whole book is about. Mm. But Jesus is saying, blessed are those who haven't seen me, and yet believe that I rose from the dead. Yeah, they believe that because they have the witness of John. Mm. That's the point. Right. So they don't have the same evidence that Thomas did? They no, they don't have evidence. the exact same evidence. Okay. No, I don't have the exact same evidence Thomas have, but I have the evidence of, of John and Matthew and Mark and Paul and Luke. And so why, why are people, do you think, more blessed for, not ha for believing that Jesus rose from the dead even though they haven't seen him the way Thomas did? Why do you think that's more of a blessing? More of a blessing. Yeah, that's what Jesus said. I don't says. know. I'd have, to, okay. I'd have to exegete that passage. But okay. obviously, um, he's saying that to people who don't have the same opportunity that Thomas has. So, okay. But, but he, it's yeah. not blind faith. It's not blind faith. You have evidence that Jesus is the Savior. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is an evidentialist because when the representative of John the Baptist comes to Jesus and says, uh, uh, John, who's in prison, wants to know if you're really the Messiah. Jesus says to him, tell John to stop asking questions and just have faith. No, he doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, look at the signs I've done. The signs are what points to the fact that I am the Messiah. So Jesus is an evidentialist. But thank you for your question, Daniel. Mm. Jesus is not an evidentialist. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name is uh, Joey. How are you doing? Good, Joey. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Yeah. So uh, I'm agnostic. I uh -huh. grew up in a Christian family for 18 years and went to college and uh, studied neuroscience. Okay. Um, and during that time, I became agnostic. And one of the things I did was I had so many conflicting ideas between what I was learning in science and what I was learning 
in the church, mm -hmm. and I couldn't bring the two together. There was mm -hmm. just a lot of contradictions and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it actually tormented me more than brought me any comfort. And I know you mentioned that happiness isn't the ultimate thing. You know, it's mm -hmm. pleasing God and stuff, and I get that. But I ultimately went on a journey where I said, okay, I'm just going to objectively look at things and say, if any new information is presented to me that betters my understanding about the current world and it is a better understanding than my current belief system and I have nothing to disprove it, then I will go with the better understanding. Mm -hmm. And over two years of just not like taking anything like, oh, like that was awesome, that must have been God, and just going, oh, that must have been coincidence, because that's most objectively a better answer, like random things happen, we know this. So going off of that direction, I ultimately ended up just going, I don't think I can be Christian anymore. I don't believe in this anymore. Okay, can you give me an idea of why? What, what piece of evidence has call, caused you to say, oh, uh, Christianity is false? There's just a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. It's like, uh, so for instance, I don't know, you mentioned Big Bang and stuff like that. Definitely think it's true. We kind of have photos. Go look it up. But um, <laughs> I'm serious. Like, um, so, but the, the thing with all of that is, like, is you might say it's true. Another Christian might say it's not. Do you believe the Earth's four and a half billion years old? Or do you believe it's 5,000 years old? Because if you say uh, it's 5,000, um, now I'm, like, really skeptical of your opinion. And you understand why? I'm absolutely convinced the universe is at least 58 years old. Yeah, at least. Okay. The, I think the, it's 14 and a half billion. Yeah, I think the better that. evidence is that it's 14 and a half billion years old, but I don't know what that has to do with Christianity or causing you to doubt. Why would that? Well, because you brought up a lot of points, and I've seen other arguments, though, before that will argue for why the Earth is 5,000 years old or why the. Okay, the but universe, how know? old the Earth is has nothing really to do with whether or not Christianity is true, because. You can interpret the text either. So, do you believe every story in the Bible is true? Then, like Noah's Ark and things like that. Like, sure. do you believe everything in the Bible is true, no matter what, all of it. Yes, if it's properly interpreted, though. So I, that's like where I would just disagree because I don't believe. I, like, for instance, there's a lot of stories in the Bible that I've come to think of, like, okay, this is a parable or a story or a life sure. lesson, but it's not necessarily a true event. And sure. It actually happened. Sure. Yeah, that's right? true. Yeah. It's, see. Look, when it says Jesus is the door, I don't think he has a doorknob and hinges. You know, we, we have, there's, there's all sorts of different literature in the Bible, and not all of it is to be interpreted literally, obviously. You know, really? Yeah, you, you, don't, you don't interpret poetry literally. So not everything in the Bible is meant to be taken literally? No, of course not. Do you think everyone in this room would agree with you? Yeah. I would hope so. I mean, I when, it, so too. when it says Jesus is the door, right? You don't think he has hinges. When Jesus says, I am the shepherd and you are the sheep, he's not, he's not talking about the fact that we're literally shepherds and sheep. So you don't think that a story like Noah's Ark is just like a folk tale type thing that was passed through oral tradition throughout time? Well, just about every culture has a flood story. Exactly. Okay. Why? It's like a very time telling thing like it's a cre it's like a creation story like maybe maybe because there was a great flood a creation story. that's what that's a possibility right it's well look you don't have to believe in noah's ark to be a christian well, correct i got to believe in this guy named jesus christ and rising from the dead which yeah. then like going back to my science thing is i don't believe that's possible unless i believe whoa, 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 he's whoa, whoa, god whoa, whoa, whoa. right no, but hold, then like hold on why is it not possible that jesus could rise from the dead because it's not ever been proven like, by what how would you prove that Give me one other example of it ever happening. If I could give you one other example, what would be the, uh, what would be the import of Jesus' resurrection? I mean, if people were popping up from the it's dead all question. over the place. But it doesn't make me believe it anymore. Well, nothing makes you believe anything. You've got to make your own choices. Exactly. So right. I'm, just, I'm just saying like that I ended up going more towards science, I ended up being more agnostic. I don't deny that a possible higher being could have ever created everything. I don't know. I don't know what caused the Big Bang. But if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Yeah, but I don't think you could ever prove it to me. Like, I don't think this talk proves it to me. What do you mean by prove? Like, factual, scientific, evidence, definitive answers, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Okay, but that's not the kind of proof that we have for historical events. 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's not a mathematical equation. You can kind of make it a mathematical equation. 
Like how? How could you prove George Washington by an equation? You can't really do that, but for instance, you can prove the Earth is roughly four and a half billion years old through material carbon dating, things like that. You know it from like, what if you studied chemistry and you take atoms and you know the rate of decay from those atoms, which is a nature of law, it's going to be true 10 million years from now, just like it was 10 okay, million Okay, but you see before. what you're doing, you're making a whole bunch of philosophical assumptions right there that you can't prove. You're assuming everything in the past is uniform, and you're assuming everything in the future will be uniform. Now, I agree with you, it probably will. Like the will. laws of nature, like gravity? Yeah. Like 9.8 meters per second squared? Yeah, yeah, down. yeah, but why? So you think that would change? Well, it could change. I don't think it will, but it how, could. How would it change, though? Unless, well, like, an asteroid blew off a huge mass of the Earth. It's well, not going to change. Well, no, no. Where do laws come from? Laws come from proven evidence over time that... No, the laws themselves, where do they come from? Where do, the, where do the laws of nature come from? Laws of nature come from men who have definitively done the same experiments with scientific method and proven. No, 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 I, I don't mean us discovering the laws of nature, the laws themselves, the force of gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces. Why are they there and why are they so persistent and consistent? I don't know. Well, see, I'm saying that's the product of a mind. Laws come from lawgivers. And the reason why the laws of nature are so consistent and precise is because this universe was put together and fine-tuned and sustained by a mind. And that's why we can do science. We can't do science if the laws of nature changed every 10 minutes. That's true. So I'm saying to get behind all this, there's a mind behind the universe. And that's why science makes sense. Do you think that it could make sense even without there being a mind behind the universe? I, I think going back to C.S. Lewis's quote that I had up here earlier, let me give you the way John Lennox put it, and then we'll move on to the next question. Yeah. John, Lennox, and John Lennox is a brilliant British, um, or actually Irish, mathematician and philosopher, teaches at Oxford. He's debated mm -hmm. Richard Dawkins several times. And what he says to his colleagues who are atheists, he says, how do you do science? And they start talking about their apparatus, and he goes, no, I don't mean science out here. I mean science here. He said, they say, with my mind. They start to say mind, and then they stop themselves, and they say, you mean with my brain? Because they don't believe they have a mind. They're materialists. And he says, yes, tell me where your brain came from. And the atheistic scientists will say, well, my brain is the product of random forces that didn't have its end in mind. And Lennox will say, and you trust it? Why would you trust anything you think if your, if your brain wasn't designed? I don't trust everything I think. <laughs> How do you know you shouldn't trust certain things you think? Oh, because man. you have a brain that was designed and you can discern w what are accurate facts from falsehoods. I mean, I don't know. I did a neuroscience degree. There's a lot of things we could go down with that, but I want to spare everyone's time. All right, well, thank so, you. But last thing, yeah. and it's just simple yes or no, and then I'm going to move on. But I would challenge anyone, like, w if you're a Christian and you really have much affirmation in your faith, would you be willing to take two years where you don't put yourself maybe in an echo chamber or confirmation bias type scenarios where you're reaffirming your faith constantly, like if I go into church or saying that was by God. Well, no, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, I'm there's, serious. I'm there's serious. a pastor who did that. He said he's going to be an atheist for a year, and now he's an atheist. Of course, if you shut everything out of Christianity, if, if Christianity is true and you shut out the Holy Spirit, yeah, you're going to become very hardened. Your heart's going to get hard. So why would you ever recommend somebody does that? Now, I agree with you what if it was that we ought to be it's open. The same question, then. If we ought to the be truth. open to reading not, not to starve ourselves from God, but we ought to be reading atheists. I read atheists. The problem is I find atheists don't read the stuff we do. That's why every time I, I, I debate an atheist, with the exception of my friend Jeffrey Louder, they never read anything, and they just get up there, and they complain about how God is running the universe. Well, that's not an argument against God. So by reading the Bible for 18 years and then taking two years to just do other things, like there wasn't any balance there that seemed more favorable towards Christianity? I don't know if I thought, but yeah. let's talk yeah, later, yeah. okay? Yeah, sure. Because we've got, got a long, hang around, hang out yeah. if you would. Yes, sir, go ahead. So. What's your name? My name's Isaac. Isaac. Now, I apologize, you guys. It's my fault. I'm letting people go too long. So if you can just get right to your question, and then we'll keep moving. Because I don't yes. want to keep guys here all night. Go yes. ahead, Isaac. All right. So, if an atheist claims that God cannot exist, I think we can all agree that that would take faith to say. Please go to a question. Right. Okay. okay. We, I don't, I don't so, need, we don't need a lecture. Just go to the question. Right. So okay, it go takes ahead. faith to say that. So here's the question. This is just one long question. Mm -hmm. So in the 1940s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And when they were discovered, they were a mystery. 
So the state of Israel hired John Allegro, among other scholars, to translate them. So John, the archaeologist, is like, okay, I'll translate these for you guys. Isaac, Isaac, please get to the question. So, okay, okay. this is the question. question the question please. requires a short setup. So Then get to the back of the line. I'm sorry. No, no, okay, okay. Here's the question. Go to the question because Here's we have question. too many people. Go ahead. It's just a quick question. So, all right. So John Allegro translated the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he concluded that Jesus was a mushroom. So unless you actually eat some psilocybin mushrooms, you're taking it on faith that Jesus was not a mushroom. So are you going to go home and eat some shrooms? Thank you, Isaac. Wait, do you have an answer? Isaac, I don't even know what the question is. Okay, thank you. Jesus was a mushroom. Thank you, thank you. That's, that, that adds to the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir, go ahead. What's your name, sir? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name is Derek. Derek? <laughs> Derek. Go ahead, Derek. <laughs> All right. My, my, my question is, my question is, why, why do you think God uh, created the possibility to choose evil? Yeah, excellent question. Because if he didn't give us free will, we couldn't love. And if we couldn't love, this wouldn't be a moral universe. Amen. So in order for there to be a moral universe where we could either choose God or reject God, we have to have free will, but that gives us the opportunity to do evil as well. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. I Sir, you are, the, you are the most succinct questioner ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, so What's I your name? Two or Nathan. Nathan, go ahead. So I had two questions, I guess, but they're quick. Um, so if, like, hypothetically, what would change your mind about Christianity, right? Like, what's, I don't know, sort of evidence or lack of evidence, whatever it would be, would change your mind about Christianity, you know, hypothetically? Christianity can be disproven, okay. unlike some other <coughs> religious worldviews, like if they found the body of Jesus somehow. If, if Jesus okay. did not rise from the mm -hmm. dead, Christianity is false. So it's a, it's a religious worldview that can be either verified or falsified. Okay. Um, Sure. Okay, sweet. And then the other one is um, if you, so if some hypothetical, hypothetical thing happened and you were not a Christian, would you be a deist, do you think, or an atheist, or what do you think you would? Hypothetically, I yeah. don't know. Okay. Because I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I always believe there had to be a first cause. Look, I didn't grow up a Christian. I always believed there had to be a first cause. I always believed in some kind of God. I just didn't know who Jesus was. And then when I started doing research, I read some books early on, like Josh McDowell's books, Evidence of Man's Verdict, More Than a Carpenter, that, be, that helped me become a Christian, and then I started to read a lot more. And so I think the evidence is there that it's true, but it's belief that. You can believe that it's true and not trust in it, just like you can believe somebody can make a great spouse and never ask them to marry you. Hmm. I see. Right? Mm -hmm. All right? All right, thanks. Thanks, Nathan. <laughs> yes, sir, what's your name? Chase. Chase, go ahead, sir. Yeah, so how would you answer a question that I would say my friend posed to me specifically about the mysteries of kind of the ancient history of humans? So you see all humans weren't homo sapiens, and so how would that fit in a biblical narrative? I know it doesn't have much to do with Jesus and the resurrection. Oh, are you talking about like Neanderthal man? Yeah, stuff like that. There's yeah. a lot of different views on that. Yeah. Uh, the current view, as I understand it, is that we all share some Neanderthal DNA. Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe 2 3%, something like mm -hmm. the, the latest that I've heard anyway. And I'm not expert in this world. This is just what I'm hearing, okay? Mm -hmm. um, which means that there was some commingling back then. And some will say there was some ancestral relationship. Others will say there wasn't an ancestral relationship, uh, that they were not fully human. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Cool. But if you want to read into that, there's a gentleman who is a biologist and geneticist from reasons.org. His mm -hmm. name is Fuzz Rana. F-U-Z-R-A-N-A, okay. and he's written on this. In fact, you can probably find articles on the website there. Just Google Fuzz Rana, Fuzz Rana right. Neanderthal, or you know, human history, mm -hmm. and see what he has to say about it. Cool, thank you. All right, thank you. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir, what's your name? Dylan. Dylan, Dylan. go ahead, sir. All right, um, I got two questions. Is that go cool? ahead. All right, so. Uh, that, that's your first. <laughs> Three questions. <laughs> Was that what that before? Okay. All right, I Go get ahead. It. All right. How do we reconcile the census of Quirinius? Yes. Um, in 6 BC being taken mm -hmm. after Herod's death in 4 BC and how that relates to mm -hmm. Christ's birth, you know, mm -hmm. it, during that time period, according to Luke. 
Okay, yeah, there, some say there were two censuses. Others say that the way the language is written, it could have been the same census. But the one who's written on this, and I don't have his answer memorized, is a guy by the name of Tim McGrew, T-I-M-M-C-G-R-E-W, a brilliant guy from University of uh, Western Michigan, thank you, Western Michigan University. And if you Google his name and that particular question, you'll find the answer. Cool. All right. All right. Tim uh, McGrew. Tim McGrew. Got yep. It. He's forgotten more than I'll ever know. Cool. All right. Um, all right. So the ne next question, um, why doesn't God just, and I'm sure you probably already answered this a bazillion times, but why doesn't God just simply show up like in New York City um, and say, yeah, because we kill him just like when he showed up in Jerusalem. I would agree with that. But. <laughs> that's probably what would happen. No, that's a great question, the hiddenness of God question. Yeah. And I think uh, an answer that Soren Kierkegaard gave many moons ago, back in the 1800s, went like this. He said, he told the story of a, a prince who had a large jurisdiction, and one day he saw from a distance a beautiful young woman who he immediately fell in love with, but she was a peasant. And so he went back to his father, the king, and he said, I love this woman. What should I do? And the king, the father, said, son, if you go to her with your chariots, if you go to her with your entourage and dressed as the prince, she may just come with you because she wants to be the queen someday and not really love you. And so you can't go that way. Well, what should I do, dad? You need to renounce the throne if you love her, and you need to become a peasant, and you need to go to her eye to eye and win her as a peer. And that's what Jesus did. He renounced the throne. He came down to this world. He allowed us to kill him so our sin could be placed upon him. He doesn't overpower us. If he overpowers us, then we might just go with him because he's displayed his power rather than because we love him. Why do you think Jesus appeared 2,000 years ago rather than today where we have, you know, modern videography and could record him, you know, that way? We're only speculating here, but 2,000 years ago in God's timing, everything came to... Um, a point where it was the best time to bring Jesus to the earth because you had uh, Roman roads, you had a virtually universal language, Koine Greek, you had relative peace, everything converged at one point there in the Middle East, and God chose to work through Judah, through Israel, and so he brought Jesus at that time. Now we're only speculating. Paul Meyer, also at Western Michigan University, has wrote, written a book called In the Fullness of Time. In the Fullness of Time. Now, again, sometimes when we ask a question, why does God do this or why doesn't he do that, we can only speculate. We don't have the mind of God. He has it. But that might be one of the reasons. All right? Thanks, Thank Frank. you, Dylan. God bless. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? Demas. Say again? Demas. Demas. Go yeah, ahead, sir. How you doing? Uh, as far as Christianity goes, there's a lot of different interpretations of the word. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your feelings on uh, denominations which are not biblical? And more specifically, the Pentecostal belief, uh, they claim that the speaking of tongues is evidence of the Holy Ghost. If that is true, does that mean that Christians that do not speak in tongues are not really saved or have the Holy Ghost? How do you know if you have the Holy Ghost? All right, excellent question. Let's, let's deal with the tongues issue. I don't separate with my Pentecostal brothers and sisters over that issue, mm -hmm. but I just don't think that tongues is required. And I think tongues are, certainly in the Bible, every time tongues are mentioned, tongues are known languages that other people can, can understand. Mm -hmm. Every time a tongue is spoken in the Bible, it's not a private prayer language. It's actually a, a spoken language. So the person who may not say, for example, speak Japanese, could get the gospel to a Japanese here by speaking that language. So I don't think tongues are a private prayer language. I think tongues are an actual language. But I don't separate from, this is a secondary or tertiary issue. 
And I certainly don't think, though, if someone's going to say you have to speak in tongues to be saved, that uh, I don't think that's true. That, you know, Jesus didn't say that he came to have everyone speak in tongues. He came for people to trust in him. Yeah, and I agree with that 100%. Okay. Um, I just have met uh, some Pentecostals, and I've even attended a Pentecost Pentecostal church uh -huh. for about a good year and a year and a half, and I believe in the speaking of tongues. Uh -huh. But I also believe that not everyone speaks in tongues. You know what I'm saying? I believe that some people have the gift of prophecy, some people mm -hmm. speak in tongues. And because um, I was, I was, I've asked the Lord to uh, give me the speaking uh, tongues um, a number of times. Uh -huh. The uh, question is, what is tongues, though? Is it a known language or is it a private prayer language? I think if you look at the evidence, it's a known language. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a reference on this. There's a great little app you can get. It's called Got Questions, the Got Questions app. The got, got, got Questions. Got questions, G O T Questions. All right. And the folks that put it together right. have answers to a lot of different questions. And if you just go in their app and search for tongues, you'll find a article on this that talks about how tongues are a known prayer, I mean, not a prayer language, but a known language from a, a, a spoken language. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you. you had a great presentation, by thank the way. You, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, my name is Noah. Hey, so, Noah? You can t so by that name, you guys can infer my child. Yes, my child. I believe in you. I am not millions of years old. Okay. And I don't have a phone. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for referencing Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, I got yeah, I had the opportunity to hear him speak live, and just a brilliant, brilliant he is. mind. Absolutely. Um, I did have a question though. You did say one thing that kind of uh, made me curious of what you meant. You said when you were referencing uh, the last chapter in Matthew regarding the Great Commission, you mm -hmm. said something along the lines of. You don't have to make someone a believer in order to make them a disciple. And you kind of made a distinction between that. Could no, you no, 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 no. What I meant was don't just stop at believer. That's what I meant. Okay. Jesus, Jesus didn't say go make believers. He said go make disciples. A disciple is somebody who's not just a believer but is actually following Jesus. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. That, that's what that I meant answers my question. So All thank right. you so much, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, Noah. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, name's Aaron. Aaron, go ahead, yeah. sir. So uh, a couple of quick things. Um, uh -huh. We both presuppose the laws of logic, right? Yes, like we sir. We both think they work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you, by the way. Um, so eternity and forever, that mm -hmm. is encompassing all time, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, eternity. Well, the question is, is there time and eternity? And that's a disputed topic, okay? Because eternity is not just endless time, all right? Because God was in eternity before he created time. Time, so, time, time was created, and so that's even what Einstein says in general relativity, that right, space, time, space, and matter are co-relative. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, not created, but, well, could yeah. be, but uh, anyways. So another question uh, about uh, the child rapist Tom. Mm -hmm. So in regards to justice, mm -hmm. uh, the penalty for sin is death biblically, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so if Tom were to accept Jesus mm -hmm. and you know, Jesus took his sin, he no longer has to pay that uh, eternal damnation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that justice? No, it's uh, called grace. So, But justice was done because the punishment was put on Jesus. So Jesus is an eternal sufferer. No, Jesus took the punishment at the cross. So, hey, hey, hang on, God. He's a little, 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 this is not like the... Amen yeah. gallery, okay? Yeah. So <laughs> go, go ahead, Aaron. Sorry. So it's just like the, uh, the timelessness of eternity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if the penalty of sin is eternal death mm -hmm. and eternal suffering, mm -hmm. then wouldn't Jesus still be in that? No, because Jesus is our atonement. He's the atonement for our sin. He took that. He doesn't have to suffer for eternity uh, in order to take our sin on. He paid for our sin at the cross and so was it grace or justice well it's both he took that doesn't that's logically not correct what why is it logically not correct because grace is the removal of justice no no justice was done at the cross all of our sin was put on jesus and then we can receive uh not punishment 
we can receive grace because our punishment is taken care of by Jesus. So both are being done. Justice is being done, but it's being done to Jesus, not to us. We're getting grace. Look, justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. We don't deserve to be forgiven, but we are. I don't agree, but... Okay, well, you don't need to tell me why, Aaron, if you don't agree. What, what would be the... Let, let Aaron finish the thought. If you don't agree, tell me why. Cause it's maybe just I... because um, getting something you don't deserve, grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if you were to have justice, which is the eternal death and mm -hmm. suffering, mm -hmm. then that has not been fulfilled. Well, remember, the, maybe, maybe you're thinking this way, and correct me if I'm wrong. You're thinking that um, in order for a sin to take place, or if a sin takes place here, it has to be punished for eternity. That's what you're thinking? That's what the Bible says. Okay, but is it just the sin done here, or is it maybe you continue to sin in hell? I don't know. Well? Also, I don't really, I'm an atheist, so I okay. would believe in Christianity if it was, were proven to me. But um, You're jumping the gun here. Yeah, I didn't even get to ask you the question. Yeah, I know. But, um, well, have you read much on it? Read what? Have you read much on Christianity? Oh, yeah. Well, my dad is a uh, Southern Baptist preacher, so... Okay, so wh why don't you believe? Um, because I'm not convinced that it's true. Why not? Because it's not convincing to me. What isn't? The Bible. Let's say the Bible isn't completely true, but Jesus rose from the dead. Could you demonstrate that? Well, it's an historical claim. We went through some of it today. Right, and the extra-biblical sources like Josephus, Tacitus, uh -huh. um, they only reference people saying they believe it. They don't actually reference the crucifixion and the resurrection. They only say people say that they believe it. Well, of course, Josephus didn't say he was a Christian. If he was, he would say, I believe it. He's saying they believe it, of course. Right. But so, Jos I, don't, I don't think there's much value in the non-Christian writers. I don't put my stock in the non-Christian writers, other than they're obviously admitting there was a Christian movement. Right. I put my movement. stock in the people who were Jews who thought they were God's chosen people who suddenly turned their world upside down and get themselves beaten, tortured, and killed and saying this really happened. And then this thing explodes out of Jerusalem when it could have been squashed by going to a tomb and saying here's the body. There's also the notion that playing the victim is a good way to get the message out. <laughs> Why do they care about getting the message out if they're going to get themselves killed? For what motive? The uh, same way the Mormons did it. They also suffered because they believed it. Well, let's not get into Mormonism oh. now, but Joseph Smith. Yeah, he, uh, he Joseph said he Smith, saw the angel. Huh? My, uh, was it yeah, but Joseph Smith did not do any miracles. Joseph Smith had golden plates. I can make golden plates in my garage. Okay? It's not a miracle to say I have golden but plates. But he made a claim that he did see it. He said so that there what? was an angel that came down and gave him a golden tablet. Yes, well, there is. So, and he died for it. No, Joseph Smith was killed in a shootout, okay, or beating. I can't remember which. Over reasons that uh, came out of his belief in Mormonism. No, I, I don't, well, I'd have to look more into his death, but it wasn't like he was, they said, recant or die, okay? But that's a whole other yeah, thing. Right. Just because whether or not Mormonism is, uh, is a, a, a parallel example to Christianity, it's not. You have to look at the evidence for Christianity and see... If, in fact, Jesus really did rise from the dead. And I have done that. But. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, I'm Tristan. Tristan. Um, Go it's, ahead. It's a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Turek. First thank of all, you, I want to say I love you. God bless you. Thank you. And so, Okay. So my question is, uh, is manslaughter objectively a sin, be it um, complete and utter, um, you know? Why do you ask? Well, well, because there's, there's, well, it's kind of not really two part, but like, be it from negligence or just complete, like you're just doing what you're supposed to do, and somebody dies because of what you're doing, and you weren't even. But then there's negligence too. Um, there are sins of omission, and there are sins of commission. So it depends on the situation. I'd have to know the situation, and okay. you'd have to evaluate it and see. Okay. I don't know. Okay, so my friend. But had there some are sins of omission. Yeah. My friend had a list of questions, um, but I just told her to pick one. All right. Um, she was too scared to come up here, but um, okay. She wants to know why are gay people considered to be sinning? It um, is God supposed to isn't? <clears throat> excuse me. 
um, isn't, supposed, isn't God supposed to accept and love everyone? He does love everyone, but does love mean approving of everything? Does it? I'm sorry, the, the second part wasn't my question, so. Oh, okay, well, look, let's just take parents. Parents in this room, if you approve of everything your child wants to do, are you loving? No. Love doesn't mean approving of everything. Love means seeking what's best for the other person. And sometimes, in order to love somebody, you have to oppose what they do mm -hmm. rather than approve of what they do. And everybody knows this. Thank you. God bless you. All right. Thank you. Hey, I'm y Yes, I'm sir. Matt. Say again, sir. My name is Matt. Hey, I'm Matt, go ahead, sir. Yeah. So I have a question about um, the free will theodicy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good theodicy because mm -hmm. um, if you don't have free will, you can't choose to love. Um, but my question is, is couldn't God, like in heaven, there won't be any sin. Mm -hmm. So people no longer sin in heaven. Could God have created that as the initial state? That's an excellent question. And I think the answer is logically yes, but probably practically no. Because but my it's logically possible that God could create a universe where nobody sinned. But it's not practically possible with free creatures because as soon as you give free creatures freedom they could do anything they want and there's one thing well, there's many things even a sovereign god can't do he can't do contradictory things he can't force free creatures to never sin yeah so my question is if free will is necessary for genuine love mm -hmm. and heaven nobody can sin anymore mm -hmm. have they lost their free will and if no. so, does love cease to exist in heaven? No, because I think that we will have free will in heaven, but... But we can't choose evil. Well, because there's no reason to choose evil in heaven. There's, there's, you're, there's no reason to take a shortcut, because you have everything you need. But Satan was in heaven. We don't have a lot of information on Satan from the Bible, but it seems to me, and I agree with William Lane Craig on this, there had to be some epistemic distance between the angels and God. In other words, he had to have some distance between himself and them so they would be free to make a choice. But it would be like if your father, your mother and father were hovering over you at all times, you would not really have free will to do what you wanted to do. He had to give them some distance. Once we've gone through this world, however, and we've made our choice, and we see God for who he is, we won't want to sin, and we won't have any reason to sin, because those three motivators I mentioned earlier, sex, money, and power, are just going to go away. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm just wondering, Adam and Eve saw God and walked with him in the cool of the evening. They had the motivation of Satan. God could have destroyed him instead of allowing him to come down here. Um, is it true that free will must exist for genuine love to exist? I think so. I think you have to have that. How, how can you truly love if you're just a robot? I That's don't not think love. you can. It's, it's a dilemma yeah. that I have myself. Um, yeah. But in heaven, we can't sin. But the love but is going to be can more still real, have free less will. Real. We can still have free will. Like, you know that marriage is an illustration of our union with Christ in heaven. When you decide to marry somebody, you have made a forever choice, and you, you forego that, that, the, the choice to have relations with other people of the same sex, in that marriage and uh, you know if you're a man and you're married to a woman you're not going to have you've forgiven easy for me to say I'm just really getting it's really getting late here and I'm getting tired when when you made that free choice to get married even though you still have free choice in the marriage you have given up your freedom to date other women same thing is true when you get to heaven once you've made that free choice to be with Jesus, you've given up, despite the fact you still have free will, you've given up the idea that you're going to reject Jesus after that. Okay, thank you. And one last thing, I don't want to be long. What about children who are aborted, 60 million, I believe, mm -hmm. since Roe v. Wade? Mm -hmm. They never went through the life experiment right. to make the decision to put their faith in Christ, and right. they're instantly brought into the heavenly state where they can't choose otherwise. Mm -hmm. All we, know they from, can't, see, that's what all we know from Scripture is this. When David's baby dies, he says, I, 
the baby won't come to me, but I will go to him. The implication is the baby's with God in heaven. Now, the other option, which isn't talked about in the Bible, God could have looked down the corridor of time and said he would have known how this baby would have chosen and made the judgment regarding afterlife based on that. We don't know. But we know God's going to be fair and he's loving. So no one's ever going to get a raw deal in the afterlife because God is, by definition, the standard of justice and love. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you for the lecture, Dr. Turk. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name is Bruce. Hey, Bruce. So the question kind of goes like this. If, so Jesus appeared in Israel, mm -hmm. and it's 2,000 years ago. How do we make the connection to bring it to modern day? Because it seems so far back that people would have difficulty accepting Christianity because it's, you know, because of the time frame. Why, why does the time frame cause a problem? Because we think that we don't have accurate information Maybe from the time? Maybe it's just not the, the connection that you would have like you would in the modern world. Are you suggesting that Jesus has to come to every generation in order to... Because I, I, I guess, it, suppose, suppose he came in 1900. What about all the people prior to that? Uh, they would say, well, why, why didn't you come earlier, right? As I mentioned earlier, it seemed like a confluence of events took place, so the first century was the proper time for Jesus to come. But we're speculating, admittedly. Right, right, yeah. right. So how do you bring that to the modern day to, I guess, give it a modern twist or modern story to, to talk to people? I'm not that. sure what the question is. I think if you mean justice and love and they're, they're universals throughout all of time. So I think the story of Jesus, the greatest story ever told, it plays in any generation. So I don't, I don't know what the question is. Okay. Well, that, that was close enough. Okay. All right. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank Appreciate you. The lecture. All right. We got three more. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wait a minute. Don't, where's Clint? Clint, sorry. Three more questions and then we're going to, we're going to vacate. Because, like, we got to go get a plane early tomorrow. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? fantastic and very enjoyable. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, my name is Debbie. Hey, Debbie. As someone who studied a lot of science for a lot of years, I have, um, I'm highly skeptical about all that stuff that people who want to identify themselves as evolutionists um, want to offer and claim as evidence. Mm -hmm. Do you think that one of the biggest problems with the theory, the way that most people try to embrace it, is the millions of years of death and suffering, the fact that um, death and suffering are a result of sin, and sin entered the world at one point, and um, that God probably <laughs> wouldn't have planned all that death and suffering. I, I, I don't think macroevolution is false because of the Bible. I think macroevolution is false on the merits. I don't think it works, okay? But to your question with regard to death, the Bible does not say that death came to all creation because of the fall. It says death came to all men because of the fall. That's Romans 5.12. So I think sometimes um, people misread what that means. It doesn't mean there could have been death prior to Adam, uh, even though he hadn't sinned yet, because it applied to men, not all creation. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you, Debbie. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Theodore, right? Yeah, we have great Go memory. Ahead, sir. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Yes, also, I uh, read the book, it's, it's great. Um, I have two questions. Go ahead. Uh, the first question, I hope this makes sense, but, um, you know, some people I've talked to say that uh, atheism is in a, a belief, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of tricky. It's kind of challenging because they're not trying to, to prove or disprove anything necessarily, mm -hmm. and so I don't know, like, like how do you go about that? Okay, like, yeah, if somebody says, I just lack a belief in God. 
there's a couple things you can say. Number one, if you just lack a belief in God, you're not really saying anything about the real world. You're not saying that God exists or doesn't exist. You're just saying that psychologically, you don't believe it, you, you lack a belief in God. Well, this water bottle lacks a belief in God. We don't call it an atheist, <laughs> right? Secondly, um, I would ask the person uh, to give me their opinion on this proposition. God exists. Would you say yes, no, or you don't know? Let's get rid of the labels for a second. If you say yes, okay, you're a theist. If you say no, you're an atheist. If you say I don't know, you're an agnostic. Let's just, let's just look at it that way. The third thing I might say, and this is why when I debate atheists, I will never debate does God exist because it makes it seem like just I have all the burden of proof. Mm. I want to debate a topic known as this. What best explains reality, theism or atheism? And what is reality? Well, reality consists of a universe. It consists of a fine-tuned universe. It consists of objective moral values, consciousness, love, um, the resurrection of Jesus. It, can, it, it, it consists of a lot that everybody needs to explain. How do you best explain that from your worldview? God or no God? Yeah. And... If atheists are just going to lack a belief in God, they're not really saying anything. Let me give you one illustration, and this will be it. If um, we're both detectives, and we come across a body, and we know it's been murdered, and you look at the body, and you look at the clues, and you go, I think suspect X is guilty. And then I say to you, well, I lack a belief that <laughs> suspect X is guilty. And you go, okay, I get that. And then you say, well, who do you think did it then? And I go, well, I don't have to come up with anybody. I just lack a belief your guy is the murderer. Am I being a good detective? I, I don't no, know. I have a burden of proof, too, to explain why there's a dead body there. And atheists have a burden of proof to explain why this universe exists and why it's fine-tuned and why there are objective moral values and consciousness and the laws of logic and our minds and life and all these things and the resurrection, if that occurred at all, you know, the evidence for that. They have to explain it just as much as the Christian does. So we have an equal burden of proof. Thank you. Yeah, that definitely um, answers my question. My second question, uh -huh. if I can, um, is you, you mentioned belief. Um, belief that and belief in. Right. And you also mentioned not stopping at belief, but then also becoming a disciple. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, um, you can, uh, we can talk about it now or later, mm -hmm. but I was curious, like, do you believe you have to be a disciple in order to be saved? I think if you are saved, you will be a disciple, but you're not saved because you're a disciple. The disciple part is a result of you being saved. It's not the cause of you being saved. Does that make sense? Yes, but I would like to talk more about it. All right, okay. well, yeah. when, I, when I can keep my eyes open, I will. Okay. All right, yeah. go ahead. All right. All right, last question. Yes, sir, what's your name? Mike. Hey, Mike. Um, I got a question regarding Joshua chapter 10, the day the sun stood still. Yes, sir. Apparently, and then also Isaiah chapter 38, with the sun died when it moved back 10 degrees. Mm -hmm. so, do you have any explanation to that? I know it's God, but... Well, I think it would be a miracle. Obviously, yeah. if God wanted to do a miracle, he could, he could do whatever he wants with the sun and maintain uh, the universe you know, such a way that life could continue. If he wants it to be a miracle, he can. God can create the universe out of nothing. He can do whatever he wants that's not logically impossible inside the universe. So yeah. I don't have any problem believing that. No, no, I don't either, yeah, but I yeah. just wondered if... Oh, how he did it? I don't know. No. So. Yeah. And again, so... We could end it at, I don't know, that would be a good place to end. But no, do no. you have anything else? Or? No, no, no. Oh, I all just, right. I just, thank all you. right, thank, thank you, Mike. You. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming out, Buckeyes. See you next year, I hope.